Great. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Linda Young, and I am a program officer with the Board on Chemical Sciences and Technology here at the National Academies. I want to extend a warm welcome to those in person and online to our workshop, Indoor Chemistry and Environmental Justice, Housing, Consumer Products, and Health Risk. This is the first of three workshops. Next month, we will meet back here on October 18th for our second workshop, which will focus on emerging areas of indoor chemistry. Um, and we've, we will put the link on the chat um, and momentarily. Uh, to, today, we gather to discuss a subject of increasing significance in our daily lives, indoor chemistry. It is a topic that impacts our health, comfort, and well-being, often operating in the background, but with profound consequences. This workshop will have a special focus on recommendations from the consensus study, Why Indoor Chemistry Matters, as they relate to environmental justice. We will explore how indoor chemistry intersects with issues of equity and social justice, recognizing that not all communities have equal access to healthy indoor environments. Before proceeding further, I want to share a bit of housekeeping rules. For those participating online, we encourage you to take part in the Q&A sessions. At various points throughout the workshop, we'll open the floor for questions. If you have a question, please type it in the chat box. Our moderators, our moderators will do their best to ensure your questions are addressed. For those in person, we have microphones in the aisles. Um, if you're able to walk to the microphone, please ask your questions there. If you're unable to access the mic, uh, please raise your hand and we will bring it to you. Um, I would like to express our gratitude to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Their generous support has made this workshop possible. I also want to take a moment to give a special thanks to our workshop planners, uh, Drs. Ellison Carter, Rima, Rima Haber, Gillian Middlestead, and Heather Stapleton. Their tireless efforts have been instrumental in shaping today's event and ensuring its success. We would also like to thank a, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, National Institute of Health, Center for Disease and Control, and the Alfred Sloan Foundation for their continual support throughout the duration of the consensus study. Finally, thank you to our staff, Ms. Brenna Aldean and Darlene Grow, your invaluable support in handling the administrative and logistical operations for the workshop made all the difference. Thank you for your tremendous contribution. In closing, I encourage all of you to engage actively ask questions, and share your perspectives. Together, we can gain a deeper understanding of why indoor chemistry matters, particularly in the context of environmental justice. Let's embark on this journey of openness, discussion, and action towards healthier indoor spaces for all. Up next, I would like to introduce Dr. Rima Haber. Dr. Haber is an Associate Professor of Environmental Health and Spatial Sciences at the University of Southern California. She currently leads the Exposure Sciences Research Program in the USC Southern California Environmental Health Sciences Center. Her research aims to understand the effects of complex air pollution mixtures and climate change related exposures in the indoor and outdoor environment on the health of vulnerable populations. Dr. Haber's expertise spans measurement, spatial, temporal, and GIS-based modeling and mobile health approaches to assessing personal exposures and health risks. She received her Doctor of Science in Environmental Health from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in 2012. Dr. Haber, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyon, for that introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being with us here today, online or in person. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the recommendations from our Why Indoor Chemistry Matters study and report that we will be focusing this dissemination workshop on these coming two days. So, why was the study even assembled? As we probably all have an appreciation by now, right? 
the indoor environment contributes significantly to human chemical exposures and health risks. And indoor chemistry plays a really important role in moderating or driving these exposures uh, to a suite of indoor air pollutants. And, and many of you might be very aware of the sort of tremendous effort and focus on outdoor air pollution and outdoor exposures, but the indoor environment, historically at least, um, has been less well studied. So part of our statement of task when this um, committee and study was assembled was that the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine will convene an ad hoc committee of scientific experts and leaders to consider the state of the art science regarding chemicals in indoor air. And specifically, we were tasked with sort of reviewing and summarizing new findings but previously underreported chemical species, reactions, and sources, as well as how they're distributed in the indoor environment and how these indoor chemistry findings fit into the context of what we already know about the link between chemical exposures, air quality, and human health. And today, specifically, we're focusing on environmental justice considerations within that larger context. So briefly, just to acknowledge my colleagues and the committee that contributed to this report, we were led by Dr. David Dorman and had 16 uh, fantastic members that we all thoroughly enjoyed working together on this study and disseminating. And the project was led by Dr. Megan Harris and Dr. Linda Nyon, now from the academies with huge support and funding from our sponsors. So briefly again, there are multiple indoor sources of chemicals, and some of you might appreciate sort of the different nature of these sources. And this is just a nice graphic from the report that summarizes a few examples. Because these emissions tend to happen indoors in these enclosed spaces, concentrations can really exceed outdoor levels or concentrations. Some of these could be episodic, some of these could be continuous humans themselves emit some um, indoor chemicals and pollutants, and some things can get formed indoors from primary chemicals. We know uh, in the research community, at least, very little about how all these sort of joint and cumulative exposures are impacting human health risks across different timescales over life courses. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this sort of space has been less well studied than the outdoors. Now, several different factors can contribute to exposure variability across individuals and populations, and also to health disparities. And as I mentioned, the focus of today is really on environmental justice and how certain groups or subgroups of the population could be disproportionately exposed to these chemicals indoors and also more vulnerable to their effects. And these factors are many. They range from being very close or sited next to outdoor sources of pollution, from substandard housing as a big emphasis and construction materials and practices, um, energy efficiency, home ventilation management, occupancy, and climate change, not the least, of course, legacy pollutants, and so on and so forth. So really, we're trying to focus today on how all these factors Look, you know, related to the location of the residence, the build quality, the housing quality together can contribute to environmental health disparities. And what can we do as a community to bring forward these recommendations from our report and, and kind of get them into action? So again, I'm just going to give you a very brief highlight of the recommendations that we selected from the report for this particular workshop. And please join us for the second workshop that Dr. Nyon mentioned that will follow up more on the science and research that we need. So one of the recommendations we're focusing on is that researchers and practitioners should include environmental justice communities in the wide range of indoor environments that they study and also engage with these communities and with scientists who work with them in formulating the research priorities and recommendations, hopefully to get towards indoor air quality standards in the future. Um, another important recommendation came about sort of from our discussions that a lot of consumer products and services could be marketed to individuals for the goal of improving indoor air quality, but several of them 
we know could influence or affect or generate indoor chemistry. So really the recommendation is that funding agencies should support interdisciplinary research to investigate the impact of these products and services on indoor chemistry and especially under realistic and widely diverse conditions and not sort of, you know, in, in one, let's say, socioeconomic uh, group or where it's convenient, right? The last recommendation we'll focus on is that, you know, also as you've seen in the pandemic, right? Low cost air sensors are ubiquitous these days and they can really inform consumers of conditions happening indoors in their environment that may prompt some action like opening your windows to ventilate if levels are high, for example. However, we still don't quite understand the impacts of these products and services and sensor prompted behaviors on indoor chemistry and subsequent sort of reactions or conditions that might take place. And so the recommendation here is to also determine or understand better how occupants access to this air quality data could lead to behavior change that could influence indoor chemistry and subsequent exposure and health. And the last conclusion from the report, that is also the emphasis of today, again, coming from sort of uh, the committee's um, comment that a lot of manufacturers are marketing novel air cleaning products and remediation services that are often of uncertain value or have not been proven to achieve, let's say, the performances they claim, and these could have adverse indoor air quality and health impacts. Some of them could be useful, some of them could be useful, useless, and some of them could be beneficial, and some of them could be harmful, and really we don't have a lot of information on these. And so thus the conclusion was that we need standardized consensus test methods to enable hopefully potential certification programs for these air cleaning products and services. And these test methods could also hopefully help regulators determine whether action is needed on these products and services. <clears throat> so with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us again. We have an exciting two days of presentations ahead, and I want to leave you with these links to our report, a summary article that is our viewpoint, and again, a reminder to join us on October 18th. So with that, it is also, well, I'm happy to take any questions if we have any in the room or online. Dr. Nyan, we don't have any. Okay, thank you so much. And with that, it is also my pleasure to introduce my colleague on the study committee and on the planning committee, Dr. Gillian Mittelstead, who's been working tirelessly with us all to organize this event. Dr. Mittelstead is an air quality and environmental health professional who leads the Tribal Healthy Homes Network, an EPA funded program of the Tulalip tribes that addresses indoor air hazards through national tribal training, research, and design of culturally tailored interventions. Dr. Middlestead also directs the Partnership for Air Matters, providing low-cost indoor air toolkits to engage and empower environmental justice communities. In her advocacy work, Dr. Middlestead recently co-chaired the EPA's Clean Air Act 50th Anniversary Report, advised the White House on indoor air quality and infectious disease transmission, and also served on a National Academies of Science work group on indoor air chemistry, which is our study here. She co-chairs the National Safe and Healthy Housing Coalition and is past chair of the Washington Asthma Initiative and the Washington Leadership Council for the American Lung Association. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gillian, who will be moderating our next session. Thank you so much. All right. Um, good morning. I'm not really sure who I'm speaking to, so we'll just go with here. Um, so I'm just going to say a few quick remarks, introduce our speakers, get us right into the day, and we have some very interesting conversation to have today. Um, just two things that I want to mention, and one is that we are talking about environmental justice within the overarching topic of indoor air chemistry. And I just want to caution the caveat that using the term environmental justice is a lovely Western politically progressive term, 
but that it shouldn't ever replace actually understanding that that is an umbrella itself for all the individual communities who have unique exposures, unique risks, and unique challenges, and that we should never substitute using that term for actually talking to, listening to, engaging with those communities, right? So that's my first caveat that I wanna say. Um, the other is that when we talk about the indoor environment, that is not a small term, it's not a homogenous term. So the indoor environment that I see and that I work in is one where every family has a unique set of exposures based on geography, zip code, life circumstances, economics, building standards or lack thereof. And that when in participating in this committee, my strongest observation was that the built environment or residential environment was that the science leads us to study a little bit more of a middle-class standardized household that may have an HVAC system, right? May have been built to code, may have been maintained. And that why this, I hope to hear today, the speakers talk about the communities, the households and the families who experience extensive disparate adverse health effects because their indoor environment does not look like the middle class household. So in order to get the nuance of what the indoor air chemical exposures are, we need to understand what those environments are for those households. And some really interesting speakers today. Um, I am first going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Patricia Fabian. And apologize, I don't have this open yet. Let's hope it's alphabetical. Okay, um, Dr. Patricia Fabian is an associate professor at the Department of Environmental Health, associate director at the Institute for Global Sustainability at Boston University, and the Boston site PI for the Consortium for Climate Risk in the Urban Northeast. She co-directs a community-engaged research study to build resilience to extreme heat in the environmental justice communities of Chelsea and East Boston, and is principal investigator of a system science project linking housing, indoor air quality, energy consumption, and health, and an indoor air quality and sustainability project in Boston, uh, K through 12 schools. Her research projects are interdisciplinary and leverage data at multiple scales, including remote sensing and exposure assessment data, electronic health records, and geospatial databases of social and environmental determinants of health. Her research group has published databases of articles in the peer-reviewed literature, and she has been quoted in multiple media outlets. Dr. Fabian was a steering committee member for the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs on the 80 by 50 greenhouse gas reduction study. So with that, Hi, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the nice, very long introduction. Appreciate it. Um, I'm here to talk. Uh, my name is Patricia Fabian. I actually grew up in Mexico. I also go by Patricia, but just uh, clarifying. And I'm here to talk about moving environmental justice indoors. I'm an engineer and I grew up in Mexico. So I feel like I came pretty late to the environmental justice community engaged research conversation, but it's been actually really fun and really rewarding and actually where we should all be, I think, uh, moving towards engineers or not. Um, so um, Gillian gave a really nice introduction to what environmental justice, I kind of want to start by framing that. This is the definition that the EPA has for environmental justice. Um, it is limited, but the reason I put it up here is because a lot of organizations use it and copy it in terms of how they then define environmental justice. So fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations and policies. Fair treatment means everybody is exposed to the same hazards or lack of hazards and meaningful involvement meaning, means everybody has a seat at the table in making decisions about their healthy spaces where they live, work and play. Historically, I think also as uh, Gillian mentioned, this is really focused on the ambient air. Uh, so citing, for example, communities near industry, uh, near a lot of car traffic, uh, dump uh, waste dumping, whether it was legal or illegal, and things like making decisions around land use. And that really has been where the conversation has, has been. Uh, maybe a lot of you have read a recent um, 
a special issue in the American Journal for Public Health that was about frontiers and environmental justice, talking about how we're missing a lot of populations by um, kind of these narrow definitions of environmental justice, back to kind of what you were saying as well. Um, so LGBTQ plus community in the conversation, uh, things like uh, consumer beauty products targeted towards people of color, uh, climate change and climate justice populations, and sort of that that also needs to be integrated. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's a really interesting collection of different articles from really great researchers. Um, I looked up, uh, it's still moving. Green goes. There we go. Um, there was a recent review article about environmental justice studies that was published that found around 3,200 uh, studies that talked about environmental justice. It was a pretty broad definition. This really included things about social vulnerability, not all necessarily environmental justice. Of those uh, 3,200 studies, you can see that the majority were about occupational exposures, followed by a good number of ambient air pollution about exposure. In indoor air was this really, really tiny uh, fraction of, of studies. Why do we need to think about this? Um, sorry. Um, uh, based on all this uh, body of literature, actually kind of starting with that first, there has been a lot more funding that has followed, which has been really gratifying to see. So probably most of you know about the Justice 40 initiative where the government says uh, that 40 at least 40% of investments need to flow to communities that have been disadvantaged, marginalized, underserved, and uh, underburdened by pollution. A good example of where this was applied was the EPA, recent EPA funding for communities to do community air pollution monitoring. So there were $50 million for environmental justice initiatives in general. This was a $20 million competition. I think it funded 50 to 70 communities, I believe, to do uh, air pollution monitoring. I looked at the list, was actually sort of excited to see whether how many of them were indoor air. And there was actually a really tiny, tiny fraction that were monitoring indoor air. It was all about putting monitors outside. Um, why? Because the conversation is dominated by outdoor, outdoor air pollution. So we need to change that. Hopefully this is part of that conversation. Why would we care about um, indoor air? So this is a study, um, if you think about environmental justice and just focusing on ambient, that sort of helps you pin down neighborhoods and communities that have high exposure to ambient air pollution. People live in homes, right? They spend most of their time indoors, sort of um, everybody knows this, around 70% of their time in their home. And if your home is leaky, then there's a lot more uh, opportunity for ambient air pollution to enter your house. If your home is closed up, less opportunity for ambient air to, to come into your house, but more opportunity for indoor pollutants to build up. So this project looked uh, was led by Anna Rosowski as part of our Environmental Health Disparity Center. And it was looking at uh, homes uh, using American Community Survey data and what their exposure was to particulate matter, so air pollution, and then looking at who lives in leaky homes, so homes that have high air exchange rates, and lives in areas where there's high ambient air pollution. And so what we found, this was for Massachusetts, looking at a block group level and then aggregating, was that um, those housing parcels that were in the highest polluted areas and leakiest homes were located in neighborhoods that had more Hispanics, 20% uh, versus 2%, households with uh, low annual income, so less than 20,000, and then individuals with less than high school degree. Now, how does that help? Okay, so now if you want to define a vulnerable community just as where the air pollution is high, you can then sort of narrow down and look at what the housing characteristics are. And we get closer to saying we need to move environmental justice indoors. We wrote a paper on this over 10 years ago now. This was led by Gary Damkowicz at uh, School of Public Health at Harvard. Um, and I was a uh, co-author on this, kind of thinking about the framing of why should we think about environmental justice in the context of indoor. Again, this is focused a lot on housing. The framework sets out four different uh, places where we can think about what's contributing to disparities in exposure. We talked already about the outdoor sources. So that's the ones we know. You know, are you close to traffic? Are you close to industrial activity, residential activity? The indoor sources are interesting. So if you think about the prevalence of gas stoves in low-income housing or in public housing or multifamily housing, there's a, a higher prevalence of gas stoves uh, exhaust fans tend to not work as well, 
or they tend to be recirculating exhaust fans instead of exhausting to the outdoors. All of those contribute to higher concentrations. Smoking rates are higher uh, in certain communities. The use of cleaning products, we'll hear more about that uh, later today in the talks, but there's culture aspects about what cleaning products get used. Um, things like personal care products, can, we'll talk about that more as well today. So uh, certain groups of people use different types of beauty products and there's marketing that's towards uh, specific groups as well. On the physical structure, this is just plain physics, right? If you live in a large box, then pollutants get diluted. If you live in a small box, then pollutants get concentrated. If you live in a house in a box that has lots of ventilation where things get removed, then you, your exposure is lower. If you live in a house that doesn't have ventilation, then from indoor sources, your exposures are higher. Things like HVAC systems and HVAC systems working. So heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, heating that has more related, more related to thermal comfort. And then activity patterns, things like cooking. Uh, we did a study in Chinatown once and there were homes that did a lot of cooking for restaurants. So all day the stove was on, the gas stove was on, the exhaust fan didn't work and there were maybe sort of windows cracked open. So thinking about um, patterns of activity that maybe different groups of people have and that we need to think about how to make homes uh, resilient to that. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that there's other things also around the social determinants of health. And the one that I'm going to pick is actually being um, a renter. If you think about uh, the ability that people have to modify any of these characteristics, whether it's living in a larger house, fixing a house, adding exhaust fans, et cetera, the people who can say they do that are the people who have the power over their house, right? And for renters, that's which is 80% of renters sometimes in environmental justice communities, that gives them zero power to make any modifications either because they don't have the, the permission to do it themselves because the landlord doesn't uh, do it and there's no sort of uh, power for the um, tenant to make the landlord do it. And so keeping in mind that there's so many renters that live in environmental justice communities and frontline communities um, and that that really is more about a, a social determinant of health that has nothing to do with kind of sort of personal individual, both sort of behaviors and, and abilities to change. Uh, this was a table actually from that 10 year old study now, kind of thinking about all the different pollutants. And here we go. So here's the list it is woefully out of date. We'll hear a lot more about how out of date this is uh, today. Um, but the one thing I did want to point out is that most of these come from indoor sources, the physical structure and activity patterns, and very few come from the outdoors. So again, really, really think need to think uh, differently about environmental justice and um, shifting the focus away from ambient air. Okay, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about heat and community engagement, the importance of community engagement in environmental justice communities. And I'm going to do that in the context of our Sea Heat project. This is a partnership with Green Roots, which is an um, environmental justice organiz community organization that works on the Mystic River in Massachusetts. It's based in Chelsea. Um, and the Goal of this project has been to build resilience to extreme heat in these environmental justice communities. Um, big team to, to just uh, quickly acknowledge, including an advisory board that included people from the city, from housing, um, community residents that were part of it, uh, part of the research team, part of the grant. And um, the reason this is important is because the solutions have to come from the city, the residents and the, the researchers. So a little bit of background on these two communities first. So Chelsea and, and East Boston. East Boston is a neighborhood of Boston. Chelsea is a city. They're both around two square miles. They have 50,000 plus residents, majority ethnic minorities. In East Boston, it's uh, almost half are Latino and a high percentage of people live before, below the poverty line. During the COVID pandemic, um, what we now know sort of from national headlines, uh, people who living in Chelsea and East Boston were the most vulnerable with the highest rates of COVID. Um, lots of essential workers who had to keep working, dense housing, um, all the things that hopefully everybody is now as part of the national conversation um, played out in Chelsea. Chelsea is a heat island, so that means it's hotter than the neighboring cities. 
There's also heat islands within Chelsea, meaning that neighborhoods are hotter, even within Chelsea as a whole is hotter, maybe um, I think we measured around six degrees hotter than what the weather station uh, reports. But then within Chelsea, some neighborhoods might be eight to 10 degrees hotter than sort of the neighborhoods that are have more green space. Part of the reason is a legacy of redlining, which was historic disinvestment in housing because of lack of um, home loans in neighborhoods that were deemed high risk. The neighborhoods deemed high risk had a higher percentage of people of color living there. And so if you don't own a home, you can't invest in it. There's implications for wealth uh, over time. And what's resulted in these neighborhoods where the housing quality is um, poor, the neighborhoods are hot. Um, Chelsea specifically has 80% impervious surface, 4% is public green space, and it has the lowest amount of tree canopy in the state, only 2%. The solutions working for the city, uh, if you think of sort of cooling, really also kind of stay in the ambient realm, which is why I wanted to kind of talk about this and how community engagement really uh, brings us indoors. Um, this is an example of the Cool Block project, which we collaborated with a lot of other uh, organizations to kind of measure the impact of cooling interventions. The cooling interventions, uh, the city had a municipal vulnerabilities planning grant to invest. Uh, Greenwoods also had some grants around green space, things like white roofs, green space, reflective pavements, and then redesigning lots like the one that you see here in the in the corner. And there's a nice uh, little video about that if anybody wants to um, watch it later. So those solutions, again, stay outside in the same way that we think about ambient air pollution is outside um, and is great. Uh, we also engaged residents and asked them about their experience of temperature indoors. We gave them sensors, personal sensors. We put sensors in their homes and uh, we asked them questions kind of through surveys, which, um, I've now become a really big advocate of mixed methods, thanks to Madeline Scammo, because if you ask questions, you only get answers about what you ask. And so you kind of need to be thinking a little bit broader on qualitative methods to get a little more depth. But from what we asked, we figured out that people spent 75% of their time indoors. Indoors, the temperature was on average around three degrees higher than outdoors. The personal monitors were around four degrees higher than the average temperature outdoors. About 87% of the time, this is on a hot week, not all year, uh, the temperature indoors was higher than the ambient temperature with a temperature difference of up to seven degrees Fahrenheit. Um, everybody had some form of, air, form of air conditioning, but pretty much everyone also said their home was hot or warm. And 38% of people said they had to make choices about which bills to pay. So rent, food, or cooling, or others. Some of the strategies were turning on air conditioning for cooling, removing clothing and opening windows. And the low, uh, less popular options were to leave the homes for a cooler area. This speaks to sort of the, the utility potentially of cooling centers. The use of ceiling fans and window shades, mostly because those actually weren't that um, available in homes. So this again, sort of answered questions that said, the indoor environment is important. Just looking at outdoor um, conditions isn't enough. Um, environmental justice communities have uh, challenges in terms of what their solutions are. Um, and then we need to ask more questions about what the solutions could be. So another project that was part of it was a photo voice that is a um, qualitative uh, research method to empower community voices uh, is one of the goals. And it's bringing groups of residents together around a theme. In this case, it was extreme heat. Uh, they come up with the topics that are important to them, uh, get a camera to take pictures on what matters to them on different themes. So it could be around cooling, green space, um, and any kind of topic. And, and here are some examples of the things that uh, came back. I'm focusing on the ones that are about the indoor environment because of this workshop, but we have a whole report with really amazing, insightful photos and quotes from, from community residents that you can look up online. So for example, this one says, this is my sweat chair. When it gets crazy hot, I pile towels on the couch and sit on them so I don't sweat onto anything. And there's always a towel at hand to wipe yourself down with. This speaks to me about the oppression, inescapableness of extreme heat. This was in 2020, 2021. We were still during COVID. So there weren't many places for people to go. So adding on to sort of where do you go during COVID, there were even less, less places. 
Uh, the second quote, just going to read kind of the bottom part, was around housing and how there's houses that have uh, grass, trees, and central air. The occupants are well protected from extreme heat, even if there are no trees on the street, but not everyone has access to such a home. We need public community spaces that protect us all. This is uh, one more example of someone saying, trying to stay cool with a huge fan. We use this fan all the time during the summer to save on the electricity bill due to the cost of AC. So that's a trade-off around affordability. The piece that's missing from this quote was also that we leave it turned on, especially when my mom is cooking all day, something like that, uh, which I can relate to uh, having the same type of mom. Um, and then uh, this last one is uh, talking about window air conditioners and how most are old, inefficient, and noisy. In our community, there are people that cannot buy new air conditioners. Many don't have storage for them, so they leave them in the windows during the winter, which then comes with its own challenges around uh, high energy bills during, during the winter. Um, so what came from this, and this is talking with the residents, right? This is uh, environmental justice uh, community residents saying, this is what's important to me, and these are what the calls to action are. So um, the four calls to action that came from that were things about where are the trees, so tree equity, who is vulnerable to heat, um, not just vulnerability, physiological vulnerability around having uh, comorbidities or sort of an ability to regulate temperature, but really uh, more social vulnerabilities. Uh, things about water, which I won't talk about here, and then how to keep cool creatively. So all of this um, got elevated. We uh, The residents did a, an exhibit at City Hall, uh, did a presentation. We had uh, banners that got moved around kind of the different parks and has been um, really sort of an amazing way to both elevate community voice uh, and sort of highlight the importance of the solutions are at home, indoors, in conjunction with everything else that cities can do outside. So key messages from the heat project, I would say, is that heat is also an indoor environmental justice problem. The solutions are complicated and housing is a key solution to it, and that we need community voices to co-design effective interventions. And this is just a time series of photos of a park that got redesigned. Um, so when it was empty, it was just a parking lot, community engaged activities, and then what the park looked like in summer of 2022. Last topic I want to talk about are schools. So heat was sort of an important thing I wanted to bring up. Um, and this uh, last topic is around schools. So raise of hands if you've ever been more than, you know, a significant amount of time in a school. Okay, good. Um, so by the time you finish high school, you've spent two to three years of your life in school. That's 365 days times two to three years, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot compared to how much time you spend in your house. But consider that in the United States, there's 50 million students in elementary schools and 750 million students worldwide. So if you multiply that times person years, that is a lot of time that kids spend in schools. And schools sort of fall through the cracks in environmental health research. There's been articles about this. Um, there's disparities in exposures uh, to schools. This is kind of uh, starting with the ambient exposure. This was a paper recently published that showed that, for example, students on uh, students uh, on free and uh, for subsidized meals have higher exposures to PM two point five and to NO two. There's uh, disparities also around racial ethnic racial racial ethnicity categories. And why do we care about indoor air quality in schools? So again, this group probably already knows, but for those that don't, it's six to 10 hours a day of your day. Teachers, not just students, but also teachers. Pollutants can be up to a hundred times higher, similar to homes, similar uh, to what has been found in homes. Poor indoor air quality can impact attendance, uh, memory, health, right? Things like asthma attacks, uh, both teacher and staff performance, and it accelerates building deterioration. So for example, things like moisture and mold. And there's a lot of inequities around uh, where schools are sited, who goes to public schools, particularly in urban areas. There's solutions. HVAC is sort of the main one. I think um, we need to be thinking about HVAC as a solution for clean indoor air and the ways that we think of electrification for climate sort of every school needs to have an HVAC system. 
Uh, this is a recent, recent government report that showed that 41% of schools, public schools across the United States have either non-existing or uh, not efficient heating, uh, um, heating ventilation and air conditioning systems. 41%, that means almost half of our public schools don't have a good way to um, keep clean air and healthy environments in schools. As Gillian mentioned, there's uh, all these, no, Rima, sorry, mentioned there's all these indoor air quality sensor campaigns that have started um, where we put out low cost sensors. This has been in homes. This is because of COVID, but schools in particular took up that challenge. And one school that um, really admirable uh, led by Catherine Welsh's team, they put out sensors in every single classroom in the school at Boston Public Schools. So around 4,500 sensors um, collecting PM 2.5, PM 10, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, temperature, and relative humidity. Besides doing that huge campaign, the other really brave part of it was to make it public. So this is uh, publicly available. You can go and look up any school, any classroom right now on the website and kind of see what the, what the measurements are. This has been really useful from an operations perspective um, to sort of in real time find problems, et cetera. Where our partnership comes in is that these sensors generate billions of data points every year. And schools are really not equipped to be doing data science, data analysis of so much data. There's limitations to low cost sensors, which we all know from the air pollution world, right? They're, uh, they're low cost for a reason. The calibration is variable, the, they drift, they go offline, et cetera. So we need to kind of figure out ways to, to analyze um, the data. Um, a little bit about Boston Public Schools. It's the oldest public school system in the United States. It serves 48,000 students from pre-kindergarten to 12th grade. <coughs> and if you look at the student demographics, um, it is also 43% Latinx, 29% African-American, Black, 15% uh, non-Hispanic white, 71% uh, low income, and almost half the kids, their uh, first language is not English. So it's an environmental justice population as well. Um, and it is representative of a lot of old school districts in the Northeast. There's 132 buildings that were all pretty old as well. Two thirds of them don't have uh, HVAC systems. So central um, HVAC, they do have uh, obviously heat because we live in the North, it's pretty cold. Um, but 70% use steam heat with limited or no ventilation or cooling. So what this partnership is, is to try to leverage all of those data by connecting to databases of, for example, um, social determinants of health, things about climate and meteorology, energy consumption, COVID interventions. So things like the portable air cleaners that got installed in the schools, they got installed for COVID. Can we figure out what they do for other, um, for other exposures and uh, other impacts on health? Things like HVAC, et cetera. These are some of the projects that we're working on. So it's linking into air quality to health, comfort, and learning, uh, thinking about operations. So a lot of schools are looking at Boston Public Schools to see, well, what are you learning? Do we need to install these many sensors? What do you get from that? Um, or can you install less? Do you need to collect data every minute or can you do it at a, a, a lower resolution? Can we calculate air exchange rates in the classrooms? If you know how to calculate air exchange rate, usually companies come and measure in a single point in time. Where else from the time? Um, climate resilience. We had a heat wave the first week of school and had school closures. Can we make decisions um, about uh, temperature in classrooms? Which types of classrooms, what kind of modifications can we make? We, for the first time, had a problem with wildfire smoke, which in the West Coast has obviously been a big issue for a really long time. In the Northeast, largely ignored because it hasn't impacted the Northeast. Um, there's electric buses. Uh, the whole country is electrifying, but Boston in particular just started with their first uh, 20 this year. What is the impact of that on indoor air quality? So lots of questions to answer, lots of opportunities to partner with schools. And um, just sort of like one of the questions, sort of quick preview, this is the only uh, results slide that I have, is a question of like, is HVAC enough? So comparing schools that have HVAC, um, we looked at the percent the amount of time that the classroom is, CO2 is above 1,000 parts per million or 2,000 parts per million. This is just during school hours. Um, and then you can see that there's the light purple would be the time below 1,000 parts per million. The light uh, orange is also. But this is for schools with HVAC, with central HVAC, and without central HVAC. 
So well, you can see that the HVAC improves indoor air quality by measuring only CO2, acknowledging all the limitations of that as just a ventilation um, indicator, that it's not always enough, right? So we need to be thinking also about connecting to building management systems, uh, what other pollutant standards, we don't have uh, standards for schools to follow. And that's the team. The reason I bring up schools is because there's a really unprecedented opportunity in terms of investments. So there's been ESSER funds, there's federal funds, there's been local funds, and, um, and the White House issued the Cleaner and Buildings Challenge uh, last fall, which means this is our opportunity to make our buildings uh, safe and clean for kids to learn. So key things that I want you to take away from this is community engagement is essential. This was for environmental justice uh, populations from our heat study and then also for the schools. We need to be thinking about emerging climate related indoor exposures like heat and wildfires, and it relates to indoor chemistry, it will impact the indoor chemistry. We need to be elevating schools as key indoor environments that we've done a ton of focus on housing. Housing is still super important, but schools need to uh, also be a focus for us. And that this really is the time to move environmental justice indoors. There's a sort of federal will, state will, certainly in Massachusetts city uh, will to do it. And um, yeah, so let's do it. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Fabian. I am now going to introduce Dr. Robin Evans Agnew, who's in our virtual environment today, probably coming from us from Tacoma, Washington, um, and a good longtime colleague with our Washington Asthma Initiative work. And hello, Robin. Uh, let me find your had it ready. Okay. Um, Dr. E Robin Evans Agnew is an associate professor in the vibrant University of Washington, Tacoma's School of Nursing and Healthcare Leadership. He is focused on upstream actions to transform inequities, especially as they relate to asthma, environmental justice, and planetary health. As a community-based nurse researcher, he has worked extensively with Black, Indigenous, people of color for community transfer transformation and environmental justice, including a nine-year community-based participatory research partnership with the... Um, I French major, not Spanish. I will not even attempt that. So Robin, please uh, clarify the group that you work with. But it was a group of new immigrant mothers of children with asthma. This group has developed and tested tools for environmental assessment of daycares, wood smoke pollution awareness, education of Spanish speaking immigrants on indoor air quality, and assessment of VOC exposures in immigrant homes. He leads a global initiative with Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments in developing the first climate justice nursing agenda for research, practice, and education. He gained his BSN at John Hopkins University in 1985, completed his master's in nursing at the University of Washington, 1998, and his PhD at UW 2011, which was concerned with asthma management inequities in black urban youth from Seattle. And very brief anecdote, um, Robin was also asthma man. So when he worked with the American Lung Association and we did community outreach events and uh, I was a volunteer, he came in a cape and turned a superhero into asthma man. And uh, I appreciate that he was willing to uh, appear that way because it engaged children. <laughs> and, um, I think you even attempted to fly once at one of the conferences. So um, with that, I'm gonna look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gillian. And that's uh, a great a great introduction. So I, I, I truly appreciate it. And it's great to be here uh, today with um, everybody uh, in this in this audience. I'm gonna uh, turn my slides on and hopefully this will all work out. I'm um, I am coming to you from the uh, land of the Puyallup tribe of Indians in the University of Washington, Tacoma, um, on the uh, uh, banks of the Puyallup River and uh, the uh, Tacoma tide flats that I am um, spending, taking a special interest in now in terms of uh, the effects on indoor air quality from um, outdoor pollution as well. 
Uh, so this is a this is an interesting uh, chance to kind of to get to tell you some of the story of my work with the mujeres latinas apoyando la comunidad, which is mums helping the community. Basically, um, uh, a group of women that I've I've worked with for for about nine years, like I said in the introduction. Um, so I, I'm going to take you through a couple of things today. I'm actually going to take you more into the kind of the methods of um, how to actually meaningfully engage people in environmental justice research on indoor air quality. And it really is the story of this amazing group of women that I got to meet. Um, it was a, an asthma support group in a English language learners uh, academy that was set up by the Tacoma School District uh, at the time. Uh, this group of women all had children who had asthma. Uh, my colleague in the health department, um, Judy Olson, had been working with them to get advice from them in terms of um, asthma prevention activities in the community. And we started to work with them. And um, over the course of nine years, uh, we did multiple projects together and uh, did some great discovery. So really, I think I'm going to center this kind of on this idea of voice and, and what voice means uh, in terms of the crisis in indoor air quality. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of background to this uh, community-based participatory research project uh, and talk specifically about uh, the methods. And, and it was great to hear um, previous colleague talk about photo voice and the importance of photo voice. I'll add my spin on photo voice and give you a little bit uh, of, of, of how I kind of think of photo voice and the power of photo voice and, and also citizen science. And uh, we'll talk some of the, about some of the results we did with an indoor air quality assessment study, looking at VOC exposures and really uh, from the voice of the community to talk about this kind of call to action where we should go. Um, so uh, just wanted to kind of give you some of the background to this community-based participatory research. Uh, the, the photo you see on the right-hand side is a presentation. This was this is after about four or five years of working together. Um, we had made some discoveries around indoor air quality. We'd done work with daycares, uh, examining, uh, developing a walkthrough assessment for daycares, using, using cameras, uh, really talking about exposures and, and the risks of indoor exposures. And uh, this group of women wanted to uh, develop a, um, a health promotion class for other new immigrant women or new immigrant uh, families and parents. And they were able to accomplish this. This is something, a class that they designed, a class that they led, a class that they uh, uh, evaluated and then and went up and went on and published their results from. Um, most of these women have basically a high school education and uh, none of them have gone to university. Uh, all of them are new immigrant uh, peoples from uh, uh, southern New Mexico, uh, southern, southern Mexico, and um, really an inspiring uh, group of people to uh, work with. Uh, they have, um, one of the things that we did to kind of set this project up uh, was to kind of have them be established as a community advisory board. And then when they when they began to think about this next project, and there's some inspiration behind this next project where, where uh, Beatrice, one of the women in the group said, you know, Robin, uh, we, we come from, you know, uh, Mexico. We want to come into it. We come into America and we want to be good Americans, right? And we go to the grocery store and, 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 in the in the villages where I, where we came from, if you go to the if you go to the store, there's maybe one or two cleaning products on the shelf. But in America, you go to a grocery store and there's an entire aisle dedicated towards cleaning products. And we want our homes to be clean. So we know that this is a big expectation in America is that we have spotless households and that we uh, can use we are supposed to be using these products. There is never really any communication with us about the dangers of these products or the things that we, things that we should be, uh, take, be paying special care to because our children have asthma. So that was kind of a call to action. Uh, one of the reasons why they did this uh, class that you can see them um, uh, presenting at, um, this, is, this was the end of their classroom presentation. Um, and, and, that's, and that's what sort of motivated this uh, future study. I, I will say that uh, working in a bilingual space takes time. Uh, there's a, a lot of back and forth. Uh, getting permission with uh, 
institutional review boards to count this as research and to value and validate uh, the voice of women is another struggle uh, to engage with. Um, having good partners around like the Puget Sound Asthma Coalition has been great. And uh, this is a list of some of those uh, studies that were in the introduction. Um, and we're gonna focus on really their um, uh, last, one of, the, one of the last latest studies, which is looking at, at uh, volatile organic chemical exposures indoors. I, I love that comment, uh, the earlier comments on the, the uh, description of environmental justice and the definitions. I'll also lift up Robert Bullard's de definition of uh, climate justice, which escapes something, uh, misses something in, in uh, governmental circles sometimes because uh, Robert Bullard always said that it's to live, learn, lurk, work, learn, play, and worship in a clean, sustainable environment. And we often uh, do not think about some of the places where we worship as indoor spaces as well. So that is something to uh, consider. Uh, really focusing though too on this idea of fair treatment and meaningful involvement, really perseverating on the idea of what it means to meaningfully involve people. Uh, to me, and, and this study I'm hopefully will show you, is it's more than just collecting data. It is analyzing data, it is disseminating data, it is taking action steps. That's um, the, the entire arc of community-involved research. Um, got this lovely bottle of Fabuloso on the right-hand side. Uh, for most people who clean in houses in America, they'll know Fabuloso. Uh, the women that I worked with were very familiar with Fabuloso um, and had not realized quite the um, respiratory effects that Fabuloso can have on small children with asthma, with small lungs. Some of my methodology and methods is uh, really to kind of center on Andrea Shirkoff, who comes from Canada, um, talks about ecofeminism. This idea that uh, mothers have local knowledge. Uh, mothers understand the urban environments uh, that they're in or their local neighborhoods. Um, they have a historical knowledge of systemic oppression. So they're bringing all of these types of knowledges in there. So both we, 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 we collect empirical data, but we also understand the epistemology, that the understanding of how truth is interpreted and the ways of knowing things is multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary, right? So this, this space that we go into in terms of involving and working with communities, we have to be able to understand and hold up uh, multiple levels, multiple ways of understanding things. Uh, uh, having a better understanding of what those other oppressive conceptual frameworks are forcing on these parents um, and these people. And, and uh, highlight again, my previous colleague's conversation about working as a working with people who are renting, right? And have less power because of landlord um, rent, renter dynamics. So here's a little bit about uh, participant design. When we, when we got these, these uh, the women that we worked with, uh, the children grew up inside the study, inside, inside our multiple studies. And in this, in this, in this latest study, uh, a lot of these uh, children were in middle school. And the women said, well, we want our children to be involved in this. We want them to understand this work. Uh, we'd also like to partner with the community that's been hosting our, our, our meetings, which had been, we've been held, holding our meetings in an Asia Pacific cultural center. And so we reached out to uh, the director of that center and developed a partnership project with both um, Asia Pacific Islander uh, youth and Latino youth for this particular project. One of the great things about photo voice is that uh, participants can be involved in all parts of the project, all parts of uh, design, data collection, analysis, and then exhibition and planning. The new layer that we added onto this was to have the youth uh, collect air samples inside the home at the same time and look for VOCs because we know from the research that very few people are looking for volatile organic chemicals inside the home. So this is the other combination. The other frame is to think about this as a citizen science activity, right? Uh, which uh, Bonnie and others, uh, when citizen science is sort of like come of age now, right? Uh, I, I went to the first European meeting of citizen science people. We were talking about our project. Uh, we are very small scale in terms of citizen science, but this idea of involving the public in the collection 
and analysis of data addressing issues of concern, including action for policy change. A lot of time inside citizen science, what you see in these big citizen science projects are a lot of data collection, but not a lot of citizens involved or people involved in the actual analysis of data. One of the things you kind of need for interdisciplinary research is to have a science shop. And you'll see uh, here on here on the right hand side, my, my colleague Joyce Dinglasan Panilio, who is uh, one of the um, uh, directors of the Math and Science Institute on campus and has a lab. Um, and uh, Joyce is an amazing educator, great, great at working with youth and uh, was a great partner with us in this project. So she supplied the Bucket Elite Air samplers, um, the youth. Uh, selected their own uh, location, uh, took their own records when they collected uh, the samples inside their own homes. And they uh, participated in sample analysis. Uh, they went back to the lab. I'll have another photograph of that when they went back to the lab to conduct the analysis and then did and, and organized the dissemination process. Some of the critical kind of questions you need to ask yourself when you're doing citizen science is, and, and this is really within citizen science and photo voices, is the theory understood by the people and based on their interests? Are the research questions relevant for people and are people emancipated to act in their own interests? So those are questions and challenges for us when we engage in this type of research. Here's an example of where we, um, uh, uh, one, of, one of the air samplers working in, in the homes of one of the youth, and this is uh, a, a, an example of their data sheet. You can see that some parts of the data filling out are, are less accurate than others, uh, but this is really a, a, a moment of engagement for the youth and engagement for, and, and learning for them in terms of how to collect samples. Uh, we, we then went back to the university lab um, and uh, here's Joyce again, demonstrating how to uh, collect a sample out of, um, uh, to, to, to reduce the sample, uh, to, to get it ready for putting in the mass spectrometer. We looked for formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, acetone and benzaldehyde um, as uh, for commonly available tests and, and, and ways to look for these chemicals in the air. air. And, then here are some of the results, right? This is uh, Camila's took a photograph. This is a photograph she took of an indoor air environment that actually hasn't been mentioned yet, which is the indoor air inside our cars, right? Um, and, uh, and, and we, we had uh, we produced these photographs. We had an exhibit. I'll show you a little bit of the exhibit later on. Uh, but we also did uh, English and Spanish language translation with these. So this pertinent question, is it good or bad for the air? Here's an air freshener and it's making the air in my car smell good. It affects me by making that my air smell great, but I don't know if it's good or bad for my air, it might get us sick. The situation exists because it makes our car smell good, but we don't know an ingredients and we don't know if it's good or bad for our breathing. We can learn to check the ingredients if we see anything that is horribly bad for our air quality. But really children beginning to encounter and have discussions with their parents about these differential exposures inside the environment uh, that may be affecting their health, but also this pregnant understanding that there's not a lot of knowledge known about how dangerous some of these chemicals are for long-term cumulative exposures, uh, which was nice to see that study quoted, which looked at uh, how, how often environmental justice studies looked at cumulative exposures. Here's, um, here's Camila's air sample, and you can see that uh, she had a, uh, she, she's able to kind of look at finding all four chemicals. I got a lot of acetone, acetaldehyde was the least. I think the chemicals came from some of our cleaning supplies. She has a photo, um, this is a photo from, of, of uh, she lined up all of, the, all of the cleaning supplies that she has in her house. The next time we try to do a place where we can actually smell good smells, right? So this idea that they were beginning to think about where, where else could I place the air sampler next time? Uh, to collect a, another level of data. This is um, uh, the setup for the exhibition in a local community hall. And here, this, the, we did something that was quite unique. What we wanted to be able to do was to begin to um, show the photographs. You can see there's a, a 
one of, one of our youth was there um, showing, talking with somebody coming by his booth. He has both his photographs that he's taken and his samples, and he has some assessment charts uh, 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 around uh, the display to give the audience an opportunity to rank uh, the photograph. The audience had sticky, sticky dots that they carried around and were able to select their favorite three photographs. Uh, uh, they were able to select their most important um, uh, essay that the uh, children had written next to their uh, next to their photograph and to their air samplers to say whether they thought this was important or not and why the audience member thought it was important. Why are we doing this? Well, uh, uh, quite a long time ago, we thought about using critical knowledge, right? This idea of using ecofeminism is to really kind of plumb uh, uh, to begin to situate the knowledge generation within the communities um, that you're working with, right? So here we have parents, family members, relations, people, other, other people from the community, some community stakeholders uh, coming to this event to see this. This is an opportunity, a real opportunity to have the people in the audience be the people driving the development of knowledge. Oh, this comes out, of course, through an audience discussion at the end. And, and at times, in, in a lot of regular photo voice activities, that's pretty much the action step. Boom, you're done. You do your exhibition and you're done. Maybe you put some things online and, you, and, and you're finished. Uh, but we didn't. We uh, worked as researchers and we, we, we took some of these this data back and had a look at it. Here's a little bit of a, a, a more... Um, uh, focused look at what some of the some of the things that we were looking at when we were doing this sort of exhibition event, right? We were doing health risk communication. Here's, here's uh, uh, Stephanie's question again. She uses that same that same question that some of the other kids had been talking about. Should it be good or bad, right? What is good or bad for our air? Do we know? How do we know? And and this one, Stephanie kind of broke the rules and said, I want to put two photos together. Um, I don't want to just have one photo, I want to have both of these photos together. So again, kids thinking around developing and taking mastery over the epistemology, right? Really beginning to de derive how knowledge is developed and communicated. And um, she looks at this, she looks at, she has these air freshener and a candle, and she also had this picture outside her apartment window, looking at mold on the edge of the, on the edge of the window. And she says, in the first picture, it has mold in the window. In the second picture, you see two of the things that make your air bad. These things affect indoor air quality because the mold can hurt you by smell and the dust you cannot see. On the other picture, they have chemicals in it, and that's why asthma is caused. This situation exists because people may be thinking that it helps you clean your air instead of opening a window and letting fresh air inside. And in the other one, people don't clean it, and the temperature can cause the mold to come in the window. What can we do about it? Well, you can clean it more often or take more care of things and stop buying these things. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting challenges that we had in trying to, try to understand and explain the risks of these um, particular substances to, uh, to, to the youth is, again, there's not much known, which is why we're having this conference, right? Uh, so we use the environmental working groups uh, assessment of uh, regular household products. Uh, from ra rating things from highest concern to lowest concern, right? And that was that was the basic because it's because it's a it's readable, it's understandable, it's explainable. Uh, we, we we were able to translate that that knowledge for for the youth and for the discussions. Uh, this is bringing uh, the data back from the audience discussion. We brought the data back um, and. Uh, my team of researchers, this is Julie Postma and, and uh, another other researchers, helping helping this helping the youth begin to uh, assess the little sticky notes that the audience members had left, and the the rank choice voting on with the sticky dots on the photographs to begin to ar arrange an album that has the most some of the most popular photographs more prominent. Right? Why is that good? It's a it's a captive focus group. We are finding photographs that resonate with the rest of the community. If we pick those photographs to attach our message to, we are effectively using you know, some marketing research to be able to advance our message and achieve change. We presented, the youth presented our, uh, their, their findings back to the advisory board. This was a final discussion section with 
uh, both the researchers, the community advisory board, which is mainly comprised of the mothers of the children in the project with some other stakeholders from both the Latino and API communities. And we sat down and we figured out together, all of us, what, what the action messages that we should be taking um, forward. So this is, um, this is uh, the, uh, the set of uh, five groups that we decided would be the target groups for our action messages. And then we determined uh, particular messages and action steps that each one of these uh, groups should do. And you'll notice we've got family and friends, right? But we also have landlords and apartment managers. We found a lot of formaldehyde exposure in some of these houses, right? Which is no doubt linked to particle board um, and, and other glued wood products in, in, that, in, in those areas. Um, but also, I, I, I love the fact that they pick neighborhood store managers. This idea that we walk down an aisle in a grocery store and we think that to be good Americans, we need to be using all of these Cleveland products to make our house not only look great, but smell great too, is one of the major crises that I think we have. We have to cons consider action at the neighborhood store manager level and also at the healthcare provider level and city and county leaders. Uh, the health department took these recommendations and has been working on updating its housing code uh, for, for the county based on these particular actions. Just in summary, um, as I'm getting close to the end, really, I think what this type of research can do is it can help you reach both the the uh, National Academies of Science recommendation around um, working across disciplines, right? Working with uh, people, my colleagues in the math and science department, looking at the environment. We were able to assay chemicals, understand chemical exposures. Uh, I'm a social scientist. I'm a, I'm a nurse researcher. Uh, we, can, we can work together to do citizen science together to achieve results. And also, thinking around it, moving beyond interdisciplinary into really what I like to think of as transdisciplinary research, working with community members, uh, working with uh, new forms of knowledge that emanate from community members. And, and then this idea of uh, citizen science and photo voice being uh, another key place for engaging people in environmental justice communities in uh, their own assessment and their work together. Uh, I love this quote that we did that came out of the evaluation at the end when we asked, uh, um, what, 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 did, what did you get out of this project at the end? Um, and and, and the, the response was, que todos trabajaron en equipo, right? I liked working with the team. The idea that this, uh, this, this, this empowers people through working together through people sharing power, people understanding, university researchers understanding that they don't have all of the power in this, um, but, they, but they do a lot of the work around the edges, such as setting up photographs for displays, providing some of the other resources for community members to be able to enact change and work on change together. I think just that's the last set slide of my references and I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, really enjoying the presentation so far. And just a reminder to those that are both in the audience as well as those that are participating from their offices or homes. Um, as you hear these field projects that are fascinating, I'm guessing that you do, you may do similar work. So please be thinking in our panel discussion of what you want to share because we do need to hear from the broad diversity of communities and regions across the country. So we hope you will be including these in whether it's a chat box, whatever it is, while we get started, or we're gonna to listen to Ashley, um, and then we're gonna to move to a panel and discussion. And we really do wanna engage as much as possible to have you participate from uh, virtually. So Ashley Schmidt is our third and final speaker in this morning's keynote. Um, I'm excited to introduce her as she's a relatively new colleague for me. And I'm excited to introduce you to her and the work that she's going to do in future decades. Um, 
She is currently the lead community health nurse with the Tulalip Tribes Community Health Department, which is in Tulalip, Washington, which is about an hour north of Seattle. Uh, she leads a team of nurses and community resource coordinators. Ashley is a Simshian Alaska native and Filipino, and she has spent her life in the Pacific Northwest Coast Salish land. To her, there is a great intersection between culture and health. Through this lens, she's had the opportunity to work with native communities at the Urban Indian Health Institute, Seattle Indian Health Board, Harborview Medical Center, and has been with Tulalip since 2019. Her mission as the lead community health nurse is to guide and assist tribal members in achieving their highest goals of wellness through outreach, health education, and community engagement. She is dedicated to breaking silos within tribal government, bridging resources, and information sharing. Sharings are driven by an overall goal of building strong tribal health systems that serve with equity and compassion. Through this work, she has developed culturally appropriate health monitoring services, such as the Elder Wellness Program and the Container for Life Program. Ashley began her work addressing access to culturally relevant health services on a population level while obtaining her undergraduate degree from the University of Washington in medical anthropology and global health in 2011. She went on to pursue her registered nurse license in 2017 and obtained her master's degree in community health nursing in 2018 from Seattle University College of Nursing. Outside of her work, Ashley fills her spirit by spending time with her three sons, all under the age five, <laughs> Um, husband, family, and friends, and immersing herself in her urban native culture in the greater Seattle area. She is a current member of the Simshian Hayuk, you can correct me, dance group, and involves herself in all opportunities to serve Indian country in her local area. And as with our other two speakers, I think you will enjoy and appreciate uh, what Ashley's going to share. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Ashley Schmidt. I am a Tsimshan Alaska Native descendant. And as Gillian said, I was raised and grew up in the Pacific Northwest Coast Salish land. Uh, my Gigi, or grandmother, was Noreen Canto, and her mother, or her mother was Annie Alford, both of the Gishbudwada Killer Whale Clan of the Kitplatla House of Sheikhs from New Malakatla, Alaska. I am a nurse by trade and a medical anthropologist by passion. And as Gillian mentioned, I am a mother of three young boys, a devoted wife, loving daughter, annoying sister, you know, all the hats. I received my undergraduate um, in medical anthropology and global health from the University of Washington in 2011. Fast forward 2017, I received my registered nurse license and shortly thereafter, my master's in the science of nursing with a specialty in community health. Understanding the intersectionality of culture and community with health and resilience have always been the driving force for my work. I am still and pr will probably forever be working to understand this intricate relationship and how to respect it. It is my guiding light. I am here with you today to take a deeper dive into this relationship one between tribal, um, tribal communities and their environments. And I will help you to explore the implications of tribal engagement and research, particularly when it applies to their indoor human behaviors. And also share with you some important lessons learned from my own experiences in mitigating public health hazards inside and outside tribal homes. I am honored to be included at the table here with you today. So as I was preparing for this session for you all in the last couple of weeks, um, there was something tugging at my heart. And, um, and I will also preface, I don't have a presentation to go along with my session. And that was very intentional, working with underserved, marginalized, and particularly tribal communities. And as Patricia and um, Robin have mentioned, listening is key. So you all get to listen to me for the next 30 minutes. But I knew that in order to share all of these lessons and um, implore you to work with tribal communities, I really did have to set a foundation. And I had to honor, I have to honor all of the lived experiences of real, current, everyday native communities. 
And also by doing this, I honor the significance of the stories I will share with you momentarily. So simply put, what modern medicine, science, and research has been telling us and is telling us today, that higher rates of poor indoor air quality is correlated with household, household crowding, indoor smoke, lack of piped water, and poverty. We also know Native communities suffer disparate rates of all four of those risk factors compared to their non-Native neighbors. We also know, based on research, that Native communities, particularly children, are at higher risks of developing asthma. We also know, based on science and data, that there are some of the highest rates of cardiovascular disease within Native communities. And as we all know on this conference, that both of those cardiovascular disease and asthma are directly related to poor air quality. So Native communities have experienced historically heavy disease burdens as a result of pollutions. So think of water contamination, mining near or on tribal lands, substandard housing. We know now because of data that 40% of on-reservation homes are considered substandard compared to 6% in outside non-Native communities. So I also, I really love that um, Patricia talked about schools because I think that that's a really big implication on that substandard building concept. And I would love to, and I would urge to find some more research on that. So I share those statistics and that foundation with you just so we can know where we came from. It's important to know where we came from, to know where we're going and to also learn from the past and of course the present so we can do better. So let's get to it. How do we message the critical nature of chemicals in the indoor environment on human health? How do we proactively engage all disciplines, increasing access to knowledge on the fundamental aspects and impacts of chem complex indoor chemistry? Well, let me tell you a little, about, about, a little bit about what I do. How did I get in front of you all here today? I'm still asking that question myself, but here we are. As Gillian mentioned, Tulalip Tribes of Reservation sits about an hour north of Seattle or about 30 minutes north of Everett where I live. It consists of 22,000 acres of beautiful land and is a beautiful community and a beautiful culture. At any given time, approximately half of the tribal membership lives within reservation boundaries. So that's about 2,500 tribal members within Tulalip Reservation. And that makes up a little over 1,750 tribal households. This upcoming December will mark my fourth year as a community health nurse for, for Tulalip Tribes. And during those past four years, I have had the opportunity to implement and partner with some remarkable services and programs. So a few months after I started, 2019, that date you know, in February 2020 will live in everyone's memory forever. COVID hit and community health was heavily involved with case tracking, um, case outreach. We worked to distribute COVID care kits. We worked very instrumental on the COVID vaccination dissemination. Um, we did a lot of public health campaigns, education. We also work within the home, so elder wellness. We, we do try to prevent isolation. We promote health monitoring. We empower tribal members and their families to take accountability for their health, but also kind of lead them there. We work with many, many different departments, uh, the Tulalip Bay Fire Department, Public Works, Senior Center, Pharmacy, and I'll, I'll discuss that here in just a minute. And I would love to share with you some key lessons learned and some of these I'm still learning today and uh, the community teaches me every single day that I work with them. One of the most important lessons learned from working within um, on boots on the ground with a community, especially a tribal community, is spending time is essential. Consistency is key. Showing up is pretty much about 50% of the job. And if you continue to show up and you continue to do that good work, and you hold yourself accountable and your word accountable, it will really, really go the extra mile. I'm gonna share three, uh, three tools. And if you combine all three, I really truly believe that your potential for capacity building will be strengthened insurmountably in any community that you work with, underserved, marginalized, or tribal. So bridge partnerships. I work every day to bridge partnerships, both with outside agencies and with intertribal or interdepartmental um, partners. So for example, 
the Tulalip Pharmacy. I talk to the pharmacist almost daily. And that can look like, you know, hey, Ashley hasn't picked up her medications in about a week. Can you go knock on her door and make sure everything's okay? Or Gillian hasn't followed up with her primary care physician in over a year, and I can't refill her medications. There's some critical ones there. Can we figure out what's going on? Why is this person not making it to the, pri to the doctors? Or maybe they don't even have a primary care physician, and how do we bridge that partnership? How do we bridge them to their care and then vice versa? So Laylet Bay Fire Department, we have an excellent relationship with the community paramedics who are also boots on the ground, and they've also worked very hard to build their trust within the, re within the reservation. We are able to call them to homes to evaluate. We have a very mutual respect between teams, and that has really allowed us to bring a very strong service mindset to the community and really promote that health and wellness and early intervention, early diagnosis. Another key part of this capacity building model is unsiloing the government. You know, the tale is old as time, but in tribal government, it's very real. There should be no reason why the Tulalip Health Clinic and Community Health Department do not work hand in hand, open communication about mutual clients. There should be no reason why we are not asked to the table to emergency preparedness planning, which we are, and I'll get to that also further in my, my session. There are strong, strong, strong opportunities for departments to work towards the same goal and br breaking down those barriers within the government itself and within your department, however you're looking at that, is going to be essential. Of course, last but not least, strong rapport and trust with your clients. So approaching these underserved, marginalized communities, and particularly in my experience with tribal communities, understanding all of those foundational statistics that I shared with you is essential. Having that respect and that humbling knowledge to approach these historically traumatized communities with that understanding is important. But I will urge all of you here today and the listeners online to shift that framework a little bit, switch that narrative from historical trauma to historical resilience. What do I mean by that? I mean that Native communities have been here since time immemorial. We all have heard that. What does that mean? That means that no one here can know any type of history that that includes. It is immemorial. What that also means is that Native peoples have been here through all of the traumas and have survived. That makes them resilient and strong and powerful. So approaching them and building this report and trust means understanding that and also leaning into that existing strength. Historical resilience should be seen as a asset. Historical trauma is not a deficit. It is an asset. It has strengthened these communities. And as long as you understand that and approach them with that respect, building that trust will be easy. And of course, showing up and being there for what you say you're going to be there and delivering that. So I do urge anyone working in Indian country to follow that framework to increase your potential for capacity building. Another very, very important key lesson that we work with every day in our department is meeting them where they're at. So you'll hear that repeated in our office, in our building many, many times a day. We meet people where they're at, but we also don't leave them there. So again, we look into their existing strengths within the community this person's existing resilience, their existing knowledge, what is their traditional knowledge and lived experience. And we use that when we approach them with any type of behavioral change or lifestyle change or recommendation. Something that I would really love to bring to the table today are examples of traditional risk mitigation within Native communities. We're here to talk about looking at human behavior and how do we communicate risk. Again, Native communities have been here since time immemorial. Before we had research, before we had data, before we had modern science, and they yet were still mitigating risk on a very local level. 
And I wanted to share some examples of those. So the Colitz tribe, the Cowlitz tribe in Washington, it's a little bit Southern of Seattle. They used a hellebore root that kept fleas and insects off of furs and skins, which is really important. Furs were used in beds during the winter to keep warm and to be able to keep fleas and insects out of their buildings was key. Arizona tribes, Southwestern tribes in that very high hot heat of the desert, they built their structures using caliche soil. So that's very rich soil, it keeps the excessive heat at bay. The Coast Salish and Alaska native tribes that use longhouses for homes had a lot of, they up to about 10 to 20 fires in any given long longhouse that was very large homing, housing many, many families. There was a lot of smoke in those uh, longhouses and they would use poles to move cedar planks around the roof to create roof vents. Or later, they also did create uh, smoke pipes in intervals, creating a ventilation system. One of my favorite stories of risk mitigation, and I will take the time to share that with you today, is from the Ho Tribe, which is down in the Key Peninsula area of um, Washington over along the coast. I was, I'll back up a little bit and let you know, I was asked to the table for emergency preparedness planning and uh, last year for the Cascadia subduction zone rising exercise. So if anyone's familiar with the Cascadia subduction zone, it's those tectonic plates along the Pacific coast. And we are very overdue for the quote unquote big one, right? It's the big, big earthquake. Um, it will be very catastrophic for the Northwest. And we, I was actually very impressed with Washington, not actually, I was impressed with Washington State for inviting the tribes to the table. And I was very happy with the Tulalip Tribes Emergency Preparedness Team who did accept that invitation and then brought a multidisciplinary team to the table to work the simulation. So we're on these conversations talking about mass care, how are we going to deal with our infrastructure? How will we deal with the buildings, et cetera? And I went home one night and I'm thinking, well, why aren't we looking at the own histories of native people. Again, time immemorial, we know I did a little research, the last major seismic activity that was uh, documented was around the 1700s. We all know native peoples were inhabiting this land at that time. So I really wanted to research and see if there was an oral tradition or any type of historical data on how did they respond to that and also prepare for that in the future. I'm going to share with you an excerpt um, from the Thunderbird and the Whale. If you do search on YouTube, it's very easy to find Ho Indian tribe, um, I think earthquake preparedness is what you search. It was a Ho Indian tribal elder being interviewed. Her name is Vi Vi Viola Reel, excuse me. And I'm just going to share with you a little excerpt of this story. We learned our oral histories from our ancestors. The Thunderbird lives in the glacier at the headwaters of the Olympic mountains. The whale, we all know, lives in the Pacific Ocean. When the Thunderbird comes out, he may not even be looking for a whale or whale hunting, but he'll go out to sea. Usually we can hear him coming with the Thunderbird and the lightning. With the thunder and lightning, excuse me. Grandfather used to say, he's coming, we can hear him. He's going a long ways, he's not stopping. When he gets to the water, he'll flap his wings. And if he flaps them hard and goes down, the water will come up and cause the tsunami. And the faster and the harder the Thunderbird comes down and lifts quickly, the wave will be bigger. But if he's going far away, we'll barely hear the thunder and see the lightning. These stories we have listened to and believed them. When we feel the ground shake, we're told to run to high ground or get away from the ocean because it's dangerous. Why I share this story with you today is because Native people have a deep knowledge that can help inform science and medicine. And oftentimes they have a deeper and more profound relationship with their environment. So again, going to these communities and understanding that they actually have something to offer you as well. They can bring something to the table as well. It's extremely important to build that relationship, bridge those partnerships and build that trust. So how do we message the correlation between poor indoor air quality and asthma? 
How do we message that biomass heating as the main source of heating and cooking is not necessarily great for their health on, over a long period of time? And biomass heating, wood, wood burning, uh, gas stoves or propane used stoves is still the highest or the number one way for most native communities on reservations to be heating their home. How do we message that using blankets or sheets over windows um, actually promotes window condensation, which leads to mold spores, which then could be released into the air? How do we message the correlation between their heart disease, their diabetes, and air quality? You use bite-size digestible information at a time. Baby steps. This is a long game. This is not a short game. I'd say in my fourth year now, I feel like I've actually built that trust to impression change. I wouldn't even say make change. I would start influencing change. And that's because this community has seen my face for the last four years. I've never gone away. I come back every day to work. I'm happy to see them. I'm happy to work with them. And that's important. And of course, we heavily rely on a harm reduction model. So Dr. Middlestead, some of her amazing research working with the Tulalip Reservation has found that human behavior in tribal communities, particularly with tribal elders, shows that about 63% of elders would prefer to just stay home no matter what. And particularly in this case, during extreme heat events. So they're not going to cooling centers, they're not going to stores with AC, they're not going to their friends or family's home. By knowing this and utilizing this research, we can use a harm reduction approach and meet them where they're at and get ahead of that. So what does that look like? We campaign for elders by using this knowledge as a tool. We remind neighbors to check on their neighbors or their elders in their neighborhood and we proactively reach out to elders and other at-risk tribal members before the extreme heat event or before the snowstorm or the before the windstorm, which is actually a big one that hits our area quite often. We provide risk communication and prevention education in the format most accessible to the community, meaning every possible method. So we use a reservation-wide text message campaign we have a literal list of every single elder that lives within the reservation boundaries and we split that list up and make phone calls. We utilize Facebook, websites, TV ads. I think I even had a vaccine campaign on a billboard on I-5 there for a minute. We publish articles in newspapers and then we do go door to door. We do that hard work of door to door, seeing their face, handing them information, in the health literacy level that they have. So I will again reiterate the, the historical resilience piece of this, especially when you're thinking of harm reduction. So oftentimes working with underserved populations or ones that have a lot of historical trauma, we do experience some pushback, some resistance to change. So I again urge you not to look at this as something to work against, not something that you have to fight or to fix. Work with it. Them pushing back and a distrust in Western medicine, modern medicine or science is quite literally a protective factor that they are carrying because of all of the traumas they have experienced. Let me remind you that Native Americans have been guinea pigs. They have been researched and then they've been left behind. So again, working with that protective factor and honoring it, you will find that you're not actually pushing against anything. You're working alongside of it. We must always remember Native America, that Native American and, and Alaskan Native communities are not secondary to Western science and medicine. We are and have be, been here since time immemorial. So this is a great time to introduce some specific considerations for engaging tribal communities in research projects and surveys, especially regarding indoor air quality and relation to their human behaviors indoors. So the National Academies in their recommendations does state that the important research should be done in a holistic approach. And I agree. But what does that look like in relation to engaging and researching tribal communities? So I love following Robin's um, presentation because he mentioned citizen science. Nothing about me without me. 
again, Native people have deep knowledge that can help inform science and medicine, but they must be treated as respected partners, as equal partners. So for example, tribes in Alaska and Canada are helping inform and guide climate change right now with knowledge, or I'm sorry, guide climate change and knowledge by reporting uncommon, unusual behavior in sea life. When you are approaching these communities to engage them for a research project or for a survey, make sure you're stating what that's going to bring them before you even approach them. And make sure you also hold yourself accountable to that promise. That should also include access to a meaningful dialogue around this actionable change. So again, going to Robin's point, having them be actively engaged in that process, have them help you define the survey questions, have the communities help you disseminate the surveys, have them be equal partners in the work. So with that, I just, again, thank everyone for having me at the table today. And the last action item I will give you is engage with your tribal communities. Um, it's not easy, I understand that. If you're hitting a barrier or not getting response, try a different department. Um, again, unsiloing that government, it should be something where if you are able to find a good contact, a good resource within that community, use that and then find your way in through that resource and build that trust to bridge those partnerships. Thank you so much. I'm gonna have a seat at the table just very briefly again for anyone listening. Um, I believe there's a chat box. So we are going to be able to in real time have someone read your questions. Please feel free if you also wanna share your case study, your research, your observation. So share, participate in this conversation. You don't necessarily have to have a question. Um, I'm just gonna take one minute to briefly summarize a couple of the key things that I heard. Um, in, I thought they were spectacularly interesting and, and really excellent work. Um, but I heard that some of the major barriers that these particular individuals are observing, and I guess I'm assuming many of you are, is that we have an aging infrastructure with significant mechanical deficiencies, and that by and large, communities of color disproportionately inhabit those communities and not coincidentally, they are a legacy of historic redlining. So as a policy in the United States, we have a legacy now, and that's a hard thing to underdo with science and best practices, right? So there will need to be systems change. So those are some of the barriers that I heard. Some of the opportunities, which was exciting that I heard among the three speakers were an awareness that there are methods like um, the photo voice and that there are ways bridges to listening, engaging, and empowering the communities. Um, I heard that there's, of course, record federal investment right now to do some retrofits, some upgrades, and some research. Um, of course, I heard a dialogue in reference to the need for standards, and that that may be our catapult to more vast improvements to substandard housing. And I also heard about, of course, historical resilience, as Ashley just described. Those are just what I heard, just a brief synopsis. Um, but it So please do me a favor. And there are specific prompts that I have now to ask you about, but I'm just going to start um, and begin our conversation by asking the speakers if you want to reflect on what you might have heard or the recommendations. And um, let's just go. And hello, Robin, you're right. <laughs> Looking down at you. Um, after having heard this and listening to what our conversation is today about the recommendations, is there something you would like to add to start with? And we'll just go down with what you'd like to get first. Well, I, I could go, I'm happy to go first. 
Um, I think one uh, from both Bob and actually and Ashley's conversation is the the amount of time and the meaningful commitment of community engagement. I think that um, everybody is talking about environmental justice, engaging with communities. Well, <laughs> good drum. Um, but I think that the funding has to be there, the expectation has to be there, and then for researchers as well. It's about developing a relationship, keeping it long-term before and after the funding and before and after the project. And um, I think as sort of federal funding organizations, that has to kind of be built in as well. So um, I think both of you alluded to that, but I think it's worth elevating. Uh, Robin, would you like to go next? Uh, sure. Uh, very impressive presentations and um, I think Ms. Smith's point about listening is really important. Uh, the, the story of the Thunderbird is an important and powerful story. And the trouble is that when we tend to listen to stories like that, we put on a scientist head and we go, this is just a story. We don't then listen to the story well enough to understand how this is actually placing people in context and connecting to knowledge that is more ancient and established. There's a, there's a real new quality of listening that has to occur with that. I think on, on a practical level, what we have with the problem with indoor, indoor air chemistry is so much is going on inside indoor environments, inside the home uh, that are related to what we wanna say is human behavior. Um, but there's a thunderbird outside, right? There are, there are forces that are outside the home that create uh, those situations inside the home. So there's a reason why, um, uh, it, you know, we, we, there was the original conversation around um, uh, this, this, uh, the, uh, Dr. Dr. Fabian talked about how homes don't all look the same, right? That they, that, that we have a very, we don't really understand what's going inside homes in terms of the number of human beings inside a home and other stuff like that. So the chemistry gets very complex very quickly. And we need to use ancient wisdom and stories to be able to explain that in a way that helps people understand how they are under threat. Uh, the, the complexity of even thinking about cumulative effects is a complicated, a really complicated scientific question. And it needs translation in an appropriate way for communities to be able to meaningfully engage with it. That's the big challenge. I think that this report is beginning to launch. Robin Ashley. Yes, thank you. Um, can you all hear me okay? So I really appreciated the community um, engagement approach for both when using the photo voice. That's actually something that uh, was a tool I utilized in master in my obtaining my master's degree. And I'm like, why haven't I brought that back to the work that I do now? So I, I do, I appreciate that uh, reminder. And there are many, many different ways to engage communities, but I think um, making sure that you're collecting their voice, right? So listening is one step, building the relationships and the trust is another, but collecting them for useful action is also extremely important. So I thank both of you for that reminder and I'm excited to bring that back to the work that we do. All right, so we have some online questions and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, read them. We can open it up to anybody here who wants to respond. If you wanna to respond to the question as bring your expertise in your online right now, feel free to answer that in the chat forum. Um, but then also, so the first question I am guessing, actually, oops, I, um, okay. One of the first questions uh, was, are there efforts towards empowering the school managers to collect and analyze their own data for local and immediate actions? And then of course, are there some lessons learned from the pandemic? So I'm just gonna direct that at you, but uh, feel free others in the audience as well. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think um, 
everybody's learning how to do this. I will say it's pretty new, right? Putting sensors in schools and sharing data with the school community. Um, there's some projects out in the UK. Um, I'm trying to remember specifically the project where um, they did a study looking at what happens if teachers can look at the CO2 levels in their classrooms or not. And does that modify behavior around things like opening windows or HVAC systems? Um, and does it matter that they can see the, the actual number on the sensor or not? Um, mm -hmm. Or is it just sort of a reminder, um, like maybe buildings can kind of remind you. And it turns out that if teachers could see the number and uh, know what it meant, right, so what was, what was a high number, that it actually did modify their behavior and then changed their CO2 concentrations. Um, that's sort of a new project. There hasn't been that much. I think um, one of the challenges is that schools can collect data and I don't think we have really great methods for sort of connecting with the community in ways that don't create big problems for the schools. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of schools that do monitoring, but very few schools actually share with the school community. Um, but I think it's this nascent field, which is why I keep sort of harping on schools and how we should um, we should be working with schools. We should be learning kind of these lessons and figure out how to engage community. Either of our other speakers want to address the school question. All right, uh, one of the next questions is, how can these wonderful projects be scaled up across the country? I can lead that a little bit. Um, I think that it's very doable. Um, you know, taking these best practices, taking what can be applied to your community or to your work and using that as a framework. Um, so ha I, I haven't been able to actually put our community health department model into a framework because I do believe it is somewhat new to tribal and Indian country. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss that with anyone that's interested, but um, it's applicable anywhere you go. If you work in a community, whether that's um, informing the science and the research behind it or your boots on the ground in the field. I think that it is applicable. You just have to find the niche and the way that you can apply it to your community. I actually think a lot about scalability because community engagement really takes, to be meaningful, right, takes a lot of time. Yeah. And if you think about how many people live in communities, general population, and then how many scientists. So to me, part of the solution is uh, engagement in a way that's training uh, mm -hmm. community scientists, right? Training community researchers. The idea is sort of how can you create uh, processes, uh, co-create processes, and then sort of how do you lead that um, in the community? Because otherwise, how do you scale? I actually have an mm -hmm. issue with how you can scale meaningful community engagement. I think it's, it's I would point. love to hear other ideas because- It's a very good point. Um, I try not to sort of overextend on too many communities because then that's not meaningful mm -hmm. engagement. That's very true. So, good idea. Yeah. Robin's smiling. Let's, let's hear <laughs> yeah, I was having a chuckle too at that comment um, uh, because because uh, uh, with 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 all due respect to the questioner, um, the 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 idea of scaling things is a colonial conception, right? Um, that it is, it's it, it's about how can we get this widget and replicate it over here in exactly the same way, and 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 that will get you the same answers, right? It's like it's like those standard surveys, right? Where we, 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 um, we, we were just talking about if you ask a question, you're going to get an answer, right? Um, but if you if you ask a very specific question, you will get a specific answer. It may not be the answer you need you you need. It may just be the answer you want, right? Um, so, uh, so that the the challenge is that communities have real contextual knowledge located in their own experiences of oppression. Um, so, the, I think rather than scale, um, I would think of this really as being a a a a. Con a a way to contribute to the policy. Policies can begin to scale at a higher level. When you begin to think about, we don't have a way right now of getting every warning label to look the same 
in the United States. We are split. We have a federal problem with the way we do warning labels on consumer products, right? Uh, the first time I had a conversation with people uh, in hazardous waste about them partnering with us for that project, they were merely concerned with these products ending up in Puget Sound, which is an environmental justice issue for sure. But they weren't really concerned about exposures inside the home in the same kind of level of safety and awareness, right? So we, we have got to really sort of, we've got to change some of the ways, some of the envelopes that we have around thinking around indoor chemistry as being threats to human health and as being uh, really, it's, it's gonna be a real struggle with the way we have set up this society to allow people products to be made uh, and tested a little bit for safety, maybe sometimes, but not really very much, and then just hand it out to consumers, right? So we, we, we're, we're kind of working backwards here in, in terms of that. That's the scale bit that I would like to see. But at the very local level, it's really listening to the local voice for local needs, local issues, local concerns that are so critically important for for the families that live in that neighborhood. And, and that's what's important. Thanks, Robin. Uh, we have a speaker here in the room. Uh, we have more speak or questions online. I'm gonna take this question. I'm gonna add a question back myself though to that because I think it's really important to the concept of scaling up. What I think is always missing in that conversation is we think if we have better methods, better data, a strong ROI, um, the capacity to engage across sectors, that all of those ingredients will result in scaling up or, or broad adoption. When I was a graduate student in upstate New York, I worked on the Head Start program. And one of the things I observed is that the ROI and was significant. So you already knew that you would reduce incarceration, you would improve you know, graduation rates, you would improve quality of life for all these underserved inner city kids. Fast forward at X number of decades, we still don't have a significant and adequate investment in Head Start. What that has taught me over the years is that institutional racism is something that is underlining everything we do. Because if we have the ROI and we still do not have adequate federal investment, that tells us that something else is going on in a framework that's invisible, but is making it difficult. So I'm posing that just as a question for us to keep thinking about is in EJ conversations, I think that is sort of an elephant in the room here. Um, sorry for my editorial, it was meant to be a question back to think about this. So thanks for your patience. And you wanna introduce yourself too, so people can. And, doc and thinking about the air quality, I'm thinking about how do you then, what are the systems in place for solutions to actually move towards solutions? And I've heard a lot about agency. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Patrick, you brought up actually Redmond last night, there's an agency to protect um, their space. Um, I think about that actually in, in schools too, right? My partner is a public speaker. Um, and when we had, you know, some more cases, we had uh, that same team at the very beginning of school. He reported that in his school, um, his classroom is over 90 degrees. That is wow. unacceptable for thinking about how kids can actually learn. But he's black in the 80s. Like, who, he's like, well, I'm told I can't, you know, turn on and, like, there's like, issues around budget. There's, like, he doesn't have a back machine. Um, he doesn't have, actually, you know, all the windows are operable in his room. Um, and I worry about, you know, uh, or I not worry, I guess, I just want to say, sitting back actually to think about how do we move this towards a solutions driven and how maybe, uh, you could talk to that. It's like when you're working with schools, like, are you, how are you dealing with the power system? Who's in charge to actually mm -hmm. make decisions? And are they at the table too? Um, besides just listening to the, the concerns, to the concerns of the teachers or of the vendors. That's a great, oh, sorry, no, it's just, uh, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, I started by saying I'm an engineer. I used to do lots of modeling, didn't talk to people, was very happy in my lab, <laughs> dumping bacteria. Um, so as I said, I'm sort of late to the game of community engagement and environmental justice, thinking about environmental justice as well. Um, 
now I'm trying to do research that is only for solutions because I'm sort of done finding associations between X and Y or finding disparities. Um, I still think there's value in that. I'm not diminishing the value of it, but for myself, I think that we have a lot of solutions already. Um, I alluded to the schools in particular, every school should have an HVAC system, whether it's for climate resilience, for environmental health disparities, for uh, like learning, ventilation, um, co extreme cold, right? Not just extreme heat. There's really no other solution, right? There's band-aids, you can put in portable air cleaners, you can put in window air conditioners, and we probably will need those to get us to the, because HVAC then takes a really long time uh, going through the political processes, the procurement processes that schools have to do. Uh, we have a shortage of um, like HVAC professionals to install. There was a shortage of sheet metal for a while. That has nothing to do with, you know, like we know what the answer is. Maybe we have the funding there for it. And then there's other things that stop that. So um, I think the solution is there. Um, how do you empower the people in the classroom to, to make the change? I think is like sharing the data, knowing like what are the solutions that can happen, um, pushing for budgets that can do the Band-Aid solutions. Uh, in extreme cases, what schools did is they just closed, right? They said, we can't keep environments uh, at a decent temperature for, for students and teachers and, and they just closed. But um, these are hard questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that question, and I don't necessarily have um, as eloquent of a response as Patricia here, but I will add just a caveat as well, right? So a lot of these um, marginalized populations in our environmental justice communities are served by a greater public school system that was not meant for them. So to, to Gillian's point, um, you know, especially in you look at a tribal, look at Tulalip tribes, for example, the Tulalip tribal students go to Marysville School District, which is run by a public school district, you know, out of Washington State and OSPI. So in terms of giving them agency, my recommendation would be to start local committees and coalitions from a community-based approach to gain and collect those voices to start urging that and give them some autonomy and voice in that. And then also go to the top level, right? If I, there have been times and instances where we've had to address, um, and we do, the Tulalip Tribes has a very amazing youth services um, department, so I won't take any credit for any of this, but um, they go directly to the top, to the OSPI, and they talk to our, to the leaders in Washington State, in Olympia, to really lobby for that change for tribal students. Um, and I have found, or I have seen some positive change from that, but it's still only scratching the surface. Um, so, you know, I think that, yeah, that's hard. That's how I'm gonna end it with, that's a hard question. <laughs> Uh, we have another uh, speaker in the room, and then we'll go back to the questions online. Thank you, uh, Paul Francisan, Colorado State University, and uh, only Commission. I just want to put in kind of my thought on a lot of what students talked about here. The only question, and kind of success. But I think that if we really want to scale, we have to very intentionally let them. If you think about the red things that we're talking about, they're not calling it. When they have an issue, they call a contractor. Maybe we don't have enough HVAC contractors, but they're calling HVAC contractors more than they're calling us. We need more HVAC contractors and we need to let go. It's not gonna scale at the science level. It's not gonna scale at the research level. It's gonna scale at the practice level, if it's gonna scale at all. So I think we have to recognize that there's there's middle actors between us and the communities and the residents. They're the ones that have the chance every single day to make a difference. And we have to let go of the science and give it to them in order for it to scale. Thank you. There's a lot of nods. <laughs> in the room and probably virtually as well as the, the student group remark. I'm gonna go through just some of the comments uh, very briefly under questions with someone that uh, Kathleen Wallace noticed or uh, notes just to uh, say she's a Lyme disease patient advocate that specializes in the syndrome of multiple chemical sensitivities 
She appreciates the work and just wants to connect with any others uh, in particular. Um, go back up. Okay, so there's a question probably for Ashley here and Spencer Ritchie. Uh, what's the best methodology to utilize the indigenous resilience and knowledge within risk management models? How can individuals and professionals respectfully engage with the community to make sure that sacred knowledge is protected? It's a challenging question, um, but also use it to improve models and policies. And are there cultural protocols in place? Um, they'll just stop there and say great questions. <laughs> um, wow, that is a very great question. Um, and I don't have all the answers. And I think that, you know, the one of the how I closed my session was reaching out to your local tribal communities. Um, and that's definitely where it's going to start, right? You know, I can't answer that question across the board for Indian country because it's going to look, look differently. I was very intentional to not, so I'm gonna back up and I'll be very intentional that I did not do a land acknowledgement in my session, which I normally like to do, but I was speaking to Gillian before today and, and I, I was it was pulling at me, but at the same time, I didn't have the opportunity to engage with the local tribes here to ask how they would like me to acknowledge their land. So that was a choice that I made because um, I would want the same respect done to me for my tribe. And so I think using that framework in your approach with Indian country is you really have to lean into how they would like to see it done. Um, now, should you use that framework um, in terms of their oral traditions and respecting their oral traditions, the same goes that way, right? Some families have oral traditions that is their oral tradition or their story that you do not have permission to share. And so you just really have to walk that um, that tightrope of respect, but also wanting to scale their stories um, up to a larger audience to be able to make that change and to share their message. So I'm not sure if I answered that whole question in the depth that it was asked, but um, I think that we should all be asking those questions of ourselves, especially, and not just Indian country, working with all marginalized populations, you know, the Hispanic communities, immigrant communities, um, they have their own, own stories to tell and they should be the ones telling them. Um, as a facilitator, I'm a bit stumped. We had four or five excellent questions and the robust speakers have already answered many of the questions that we put out. So we can, um, I, I guess I will ask you just to go back as we wrap up, we have, there's no reason to not end early and have a break. I know we all have emails to answer, um, but I am gonna pose just a few, one, oh, there's a one more question online. Let me go to that first. I have a question if that will be okay. okay. No, please don't. Okay. Uh, oh, Miriam has her hand raised. The slow processing going on. Her hand <laughs> still, you can probably even see them traveling to the other side of the brain. Um, Miriam, please go ahead. You, I believe you can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate you on this great workshop, and I'm very sorry I'm not there in person. I have two comments. Um, my first comment uh, for the panelists is about citizen science, which um, it uh, I'm I'm working on this in another context in terms of international aid work, and it occurred to us that citizen science is a very colonialist construct because um, uh, and also coming from a Canadian viewpoint where we're working uh, hopefully on reconciliation it's not about citizen engagement it's about the co-production of information um, of devising the questions and the use of different knowledge systems. So I'm, I, I think there's a very flourishing area of citizen science, but I challenge myself to, um, to identify that that is really appropriate and that I'm not at, uh, contributing to a colonialized construct. So I, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna ask the, um, see if the panelists want to respond and then I have another comment to make. 
Well, I, I wrote a paper about this, um, about about the the place where citizen science can, kind of connects with uh, action research. You know, so I I do think that you make a good point. Um, first off, the name citizen science is not very uh, open and inviting, um, but I but I do think that it has a kind of a nice broad engagement inside the community, right? So the community. What 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 happened with our youth and parents was this engagement with and this empowerment with these are all kids that are almost you know in in college age or, or going to college now right but when we when we did the research with them three or four years ago they were in middle school and and, and so there's a really sort of like okay uh, but we want these kids to kind of understand a college, another colonial type of environment, a university, but come see this open university where, you know, we're, we're, we're grounded in the community at UW Tacoma. We bring them into the lab, we get them involved and stuff. They begin to kind of see that they have a part, they have a place here. Um, uh, seeing a, 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 um, a person of color as, as a professor, uh, giving them skills in terms of how to, how to essay chemicals and other things like this. It begins to stop the chemical elitism that can go on with that. So I think citizen science, as much as it breaks down elitism and classism in science, I think is really, really important. But you're right. It comes with some baggage. And perhaps the biggest baggage is that it's extraction focused, Miriam. So I would, I would agree that if, it's, if you're only interested in gathering all the data, give me all the data, and then I'll go away and hide in my little box and come up with my great paper that's going to explain the world to everybody who wants to listen to it, then you've, you've lost the point. The point is the engagement throughout. But the, ch the challenge often, if you, if you do it, we, we've done sort of uh, some analyses of papers. I haven't, I haven't published anything recently in terms of actual how, how people actually engage throughout the entire project, right? Uh, we give up a lot of times when it gets to the analysis because we go this is too complicated too difficult for you and so we're going to go into our little black box and figure this out and come back and tell you the answer and that's 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 a shame uh, we want the national academies of science to be able to give us good data in terms of exposure um uh at risks and all this other kind of stuff we need that but in terms of actually engaging people for change we need we need to break down those barriers so yes there's some problems with the name and some problems with some of the ways it's conducted, but I think it can work. And I've, I've been seeing some other projects on the side where other people have done this. Uh, we're using citizen science and working in native communities. So kind of, kind of, I think it's, I think this is sort of like a sub variant of citizen science that we've been doing. I will add before you ask your second question that if you watch the federal granting process, hundreds of millions of dollars from NIH, from CDC. Um, by and large, you have to be a research institution with a PI who's a, you know, has appropriate degrees behind their name. And they always say as a criteria should engage environmental justice communities. The funding doesn't go to the communities who say then you should engage research institutions. So our entire system of where the money goes to build knowledge is right now upside down. And, and it may be, I'm not, and it shouldn't even be hierarchical, frankly, which it is, but it's certainly upside down right now. So just had to add that. So you had a second, Miriam, I believe, a uh, component to your question or observation. Yes, and Gillian, I really appreciate your comment because for the international development field, it is, it's uh, important for donors to have fiduciary responsibility to go to the international aid industry <laughs> and not to communities. Yeah. So I appreciate your comment. My second comment is more annoying and it really is annoying. <laughs> so low cost sensors are great for empowering the people who use them. They are so not great for the people who are supplying the critical minerals uh, that upon which the low cost sensors are based. And they are low cost because the materials that go into the sensors are coming from um, largely exploited uh, communities. 
mm-hmm. overseas. And then they get the sensors back after they don't work as e-waste. This is a, a, a very troubling problem where we in the wealthy world benefit from extractive, environmentally damaging, human health damaging processes. Uh, and we benefit from the data, but we need to take a life cycle approach to understand all the implications. I don't have an answer for this, but it's really a problem. Excellent, sobering observation. Uh, any? I have a comment on that, which is sort of, it, it came up in the chat. Um, there was a question about indigenous frames or, or ways of or ways of beginning to think um, uh, uh, around this. It, I, th- I think it was it was motivated by um, uh, uh, the the panelists our, our conversations of, uh, about all of this, but especially Ashley Smith's um, uh, comments around working with indigenous communities. And 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 I would su- suggest that I think that there is a new there's there's new Ways of considering there's new theoretical and new uh, and new ways of understanding how uh, we th- participate in planetary health uh, conceptions around this, right? So trying to broaden our lens if we're going interdisciplinary, uh, we're going transdisciplinary, and really thinking about planetary health effects. We had heat, but we we consider heat as well. Uh, so just trying to keep the frame a little bit broader uh, would would be a good caution for us, um, and certainly. I agree uh, that we have to be very careful about these new sensors and the latest technology that's going to fix something that is really burdening um, uh, the global south, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else in the room? Anyone else online? All right. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Laurel Rui. I, um, uh, I run a small uh, consultant for focused on environmental and human health. And um, one, I'm very grateful to be able to meet you guys today. So um, thank you for for opening up this this opportunity. Um, Last week at the UN UN Science Summit, um, the opening, I I spoke on a panel with some colleagues um, from several countries. And we talked about inclusive science um, for um, achieving sustainable development in um, this climate changing world. And it's almost, you know, the same topics that we raised, um, except it was brother as um, the, 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 the speaker who just joined us um, shared around thinking critically across um, the just transitions that we're doing right mm-hmm. now and ensuring that as we um, find solutions for, for issues that unfortunately, you know, chemist, chemistry has created, um, you know, with, with, you know, from, from eons ago, that we don't impact, negatively impact others, right? Um, and But one of the, the questions I'd like to ask more specifically has to do with data ownership and data sovereignty. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the question was posed around, uh, you know, how we, um, you know, acknowledge and preserve the knowledge, but I would like to, to take it a step further and say, can we protect it as intellectual property? Mm-hmm. I think when we when we call indigenous knowledge um, intellectual property, it has an economic impact, right? On the value of that knowledge in this space. Um, so I wondered if you guys can talk a little bit about how you ensure um, not only the availability of the data that you collect, but the access to that data so that the community groups that you're working with can then take that data and apply for grants themselves um, and kind of just bring that bring that circle around and, and if there's opportunity for intellectual um, property acknowledgement. And the last thing I'll ask, because there are lots of academics in the room and perhaps online, as you think through the compensation model of engaging with communities, do you have any thoughts on how that can be changed? Because as I work with communities, I think um, 
there's a devaluing of the compensation with just, you know, like the quote unquote Walmart gift card for blood samples or coming into people's um, sacred spaces. So I know that's a lot and, and you know, um, I'd be happy to chat, but I just wanted to, to kind of share that whole conversation. Thank you. Um, I'll start just simply because I don't I don't think I have an answer for that. I'm not a publisher. I'm not the, on the publishing side in terms of utilizing the data on a grander scheme. But I would say that I love that concept of intellectual property. And if you don't mind, I'm going to borrow that. <laughs> I'm going to bring that back. <laughs> I have a couple of comments. And thank you for bringing both of those points up. They're really, really important. One is on the funding model. I think there's um, slowly a shift from funding organizations to say we need to be funding communities. I think grants are not coming out saying the minimum percentage of the budget should go yeah. to the community engagement. It's still not quite enough. Like I think we were applying for one that says 15%. Well, could we bump that up a little bit more? Um, but sort of we've gone through, it should be more meaningful engagement, or we need to fund this, or we need to require scientists to fund it. Because I will say that sitting at the table with us as scientists, it's really hard to get community engagement budget up. It's just really challenging. So um, easy to sort of think of, uh, I don't know, planning for a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment. Not so much uh, to say, and then let's put a hundred thousand dollars into the community engagement budget. It's amazing. So, so that's one thing. Sort of as scientists, sort of sitting with groups is, is advocating for that. Um, sitting at the table when there's listening sessions from NSF and NOAA and NIH, right, and sort of pushing for that to be there as well. Um, I don't know what the right number is either, right? For that, we need to sort of sit with communities and say, well, what is what is suitable compensation? Is there compensation for someone giving um, a blood sample? And is that different mm -hmm. in different communities because it, it, it means different things, right? Um, so I don't have an answer for that other than, other than people need to be put at the table to make things happen. Um, I think the other point that you made was on data. And data ownership, I think, um, you know, again, say I've been doing community research for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. I did it really poorly initially. It was sort of, here's the data. I didn't keep it. Here are the data for people to use. But if I share one minute level or 10 second data of PM 2.5 values over the last 10 years, that means nothing is totally useless for pretty much any other person, unless you're a data scientist or a statistician. Um, so what I've sort of come around and working toward is that there's, that what you need to do is be collaborating and then be asking sort of constantly, how can the data be used? Um, I also think, for example, you alluded about to grants, uh, to grants. When community organizations need data for grants is tomorrow, when the grant is due, not in three years when the paper gets published and um, maybe what you published were, I don't know, yearly averages and what you needed was a maximum, et cetera. So I almost feel like we need two tracks. That is sort of the slow research machine. That's the publication papers that uh, academics need to, you know, get promoted and keep the research, you know, some research going, et cetera. And then a different track that is really the collaborative research track. Um, that is, what do you need? What questions do you need answered? And let's, you know, answer them. What uh, like co-created knowledge do we need to create, et cetera? And just have that sort of sidetrack uh, that happens at the same time. I'm finding that. I'm not saying I do it 100% right, but I'm just finding that that works so much better than um, a project where it took three years to write a paper and then the community really couldn't use the what we learned. We learned together. It was, you know, they were co-authors on the papers, et cetera. That's pretty much, you know, it's good, but not necessarily what people may want or need, so. <laughs> question um it's more of just out of curiosity um from your own personal experience working on the ground with these um communities for example the school um how did the conversation initially started like who did you go to and um how, what, what was that conversation like so the school work 
it's pretty new. They just filmed the pandemic where it started last year now. Um, and the way that started really is Boston Public Schools started this censor campaign. Really, it was remarkable that they, that they did it. It was for a lot of different reasons. So again, there's 4,500 censors, one in each classroom, mm -hmm. I'll check that, uh, also up on the roof. And um, heard about it, so maybe got it in the paper that this was happening, um, and called the school and said, can you help, how can we help? Uh, that's really kind of how it started. I think, um, I don't know how helpful we've been, we've tried. Uh, but it, again, sort of ongoing collaboration. Now, school community is complex, right? Well, community is complex in general. Like, when we say community is sort of, there are just so many levers and layers and different types of people with all different interests, et cetera. So we're working really closely with the school, with school staff, um, operations, um, and then sort of expanding into teachers, students, everybody comes with their preconceived ideas of what is important, not important, right? Everybody has what, uh, what they think, what they care about, et cetera. So I would say the short answer to your question is ask, how can we help? Um, to initiate conversations, and then maybe that goes in a direction, maybe it doesn't. But so far, with the schools, that's what's been um, a good approach. Thank you. I just wanted to add, too, that I've experienced a high degree of receptivity in working with um, early childhood education. So you have the birth to age five cohort, and Eileen Gagne, a colleague who's, who's I think, um, listening today, knows that those teachers see them from infants to toddlers. They know every child in that room who has RSV, who has um, bronchiolitis, who has then you know recurrent wheezing. They see the children playing on the floor. They see rashes develop on the skin when different chemical products are used in cleaning. And that's a very, I've, we found the greatest reception because it's almost like they have a very visceral experience with the students who in those exposure scenarios. Um, I don't know once you get to, you know, kindergarten through grade 12, if then it's your school nurses also who can be a pipeline to observing acute health effects in some of the children, right? Um, of course, we're talking about long term, but I just wanted to add that that's been an interesting receptive group to work with. Um, I will also, I will also add, add that. that. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Finding champions within your community is also key. So have you get that initial buy-in, you start your work, but you know, assuming that you've built the trust, you've been working with this community, you have champions already in your back pocket that you can come to. So a lot of the projects that I've um, kind of spearheaded with Tulalip, I will go to my champions and those are tribal members or other heads of other departments and say, this is what we're trying to do. This is the project we're trying to launch. Can I have you front facing with the community to speak about it? Because community members are going to want to listen to other community members. They don't necessarily want to listen to you. Um, so that that was my add to the piece of of how to start that conversation. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone to our indoor chemistry workshop. Uh, we are now starting the afternoon session. We have two more sessions to go with our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much to our morning speakers for such an amazing session. Um, our next session is called Putting Environmental Exposures in Context, Frameworks for Research and Implementation to Holistically Address Environmental and Social Exposures. And we have two speakers. We have Dr. Madeline Scammell, who will start. She will be virtual. And then we have Dr. Michaela Martinez as well. So let me start by introducing Dr. Scammell. Dr. Madeline Scammell is an associate professor of environmental health at Boston University School of Public Health. Her expertise is in the area of community-driven and community-based participatory research, and includes the use of qualitative methods in the area of environmental health and epidemiologic studies. In 2017, Dr. Scammell was awarded an NIHS, NIH Outstanding New Environmental Scientist Award, establishing the Mesoamerican Nepro Neprophet sorry, Nepropathy Occupational Study, which is a longitudinal study of agricultural workers in El Salvador and Nicaragua, focused on identifying and preventing 
exposures associated with the epidemic of chronic kidney disease in Central America. She was also awarded a U01 to establish a field epidemiology site as part of the NIDDK, NIEHS, and Fogarty Institute Cure Consortium, which is also studying chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology in agricultural communities. Um, in Massachusetts, where she is based, Dr. Scammell leads the local public health institute with funding from the Mass Department of Public Health. She co-leads the Chelsea and East Boston heat study that you heard about from Dr. Patricia Fabien earlier, examining exposure to heat and air quality where we live, work, and play. Dr. Scammell chairs the board of directors of the Science and Environmental Health Network, and in 2014, co-edited the Toxic Schoolhouse, published by Baywood Press. Dr. Scammell, are you online? I am. Can you? Um, please get started when you're ready. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm sorry that I'm not with you um, in person. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Go. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I am speaking to you from Chelsea, Massachusetts, uh, where Patricia spoke of this morning. I really appreciated that talk. I've appreciated all of the talks I'm listening. Um, and when I came up with the title for this, talk, I really wasn't sure what I would talk about, except I was really struck by this phrase, realistic conditions, um, in the recommendations uh, that funding agencies should support interdisciplinary research mm -mm -mm, under realistic conditions. And so I'll talk about those two concepts um, today, and also Matt. a little I'm sorry to interrupt you. If you don't mind, could you speak more into the microphone so we could hear you better? Of course. Is and I will say the better? same thing to all our speakers, please. We've noticed in the first session that it's been a little bit hard to hear. So everyone, please speak more into the microphone. Thank you and apologies for interrupting you. That's okay. Please interrupt me again if, if you have to. Yes. Okay. Um, so my... My goal is to talk about interdisciplinary research under realistic conditions, um, including in environmental justice communities. And I'll talk a little bit about access to air quality. So um, the, the title of my talk could alternatively have been two stories, the toilet and the outlet. And I may have imagined giving a talk at the National Academies never about a toilet. Um, and before telling you these two stories about the toilet and the outlet, I also have to make a confession that I am not a plumber, I'm not an electrician, I'm not an engineer or a chemist. Um, I, you, you know enough about me, um, I'm not any of those things. So, okay, that being said, the first story of the toilet has a longer title, it's a field study of vapor intrusion in an urban neighborhood. And um, my co-authors of this story are listed below. Um, this is over 10 years old. At the time, I was the community engagement coordinator for the Boston University Superfund Research Program. And um, Kelly Pennell and Eric Suberg were both engineers with the Brown University Superfund Research Program, and they have a model of vapor intrusion that they wanted to test with some field data. Around the same time, the Mass Department of Environmental Protection approached them with a site of contamination that was causing trouble. Their vapor intrusion analyses were not what they hoped they would be. The site was very complicated. Um, meanwhile, our community engagement partner had also reached out to us because the residents in the site were not happy with the management of the site. So to talk a little bit about the classic vapor intrusion model, this figure depicts the volatilization of chemicals from the ground and groundwater 
into a building, uh, the foundation or the basement exerted uh, because of the pressure exerted by the building on the structure. Um, it also is influenced by the temperature of the air, of the soil, the type of building, the ventilation of the building, and the ground immediately surrounding the building, if it's pavement or a field. And soil type, which turned out to be really important in our study, but that's not what I'm going to talk about uh, right now. Um, I'm going to tell you the story, as I said, of the toilet. But at the time, I will say, the State Department of Environmental Protection was looking to present new vapor intrusion regulations. Um, this pathway is examined with almost every contaminated site across the country. Um, and is essential for human health risk assessment. Um, also at that time, the US Environmental Protection Agency was planning to issue their final guidance for, va for vapor intrusion. So that was the context of our study. And this is the site. So what you see here is an urban neighborhood near Boston, where for nearly 50 years, the big warehouse that's shown in red was the transport site for bulk shipments of tetrachloroethylene or PCE from train to truck. And during that process, there was a lot of leaking of that solvent that went into the ground, created a groundwater plume of contamination affecting about 70 homes and the school. So when this was realized, the contractor for the responsible party went door to door to tell every resident in the area about this hazard and that they needed to come in and do some sampling immediately. This created quite a bit of an alarm, in part due to the fact that the door knocking took place on Christmas Eve. Um, and residents responded by saying, mm -mm, no company, no contractors, no government are coming into our homes. We don't care what you say about this chemical. It's not that hazardous. Um, there was even a hairdresser who uh, was a vocal opponent of any intervention who said, I work with chemicals that are much more hazardous and I'm fine. I, in my attempt to recruit residents from this area who um, did not have mitigation systems installed I actually got my hair cut by this person. I brought my mother there. And despite a lovely haircut and a lot of conversation, I was not successful at recruiting this person to participate in our study. We had envisioned recruiting a dozen homeowners. We ended up with three, three residents who were willing to participate in the study. Uh, one of them had a sign on his home that said hazardous waste site, uh, and the other had no basement. Uh, but in every house, we were able to measure soil gas outside and through the basement, indoor air, ambient air, groundwater through modeling, uh, monitoring wells. Um, but this is the story of the single home that already had a mitigation system installed. They had a beautiful basement. It was overkill, according to the engineers. They didn't want to include this home in the study because that's not the kind of home they were looking for to test their model. But this person wanted to be in the study and had real concerns about the solvents in their home. So we all agreed, okay, we only have three people who are interested, we'll include this household. And we monitored in their basement and on the first floor and outside. We did everything that we, we did for the other two homes. What we found as a result of the monitoring was that the PCE concentrations in the basement were lower than on the first floor, but still well above the threshold level for action in this situation. And the first floor exceeded cancer risk guidelines. There were no known sources of PCE anywhere in the house. We did a complete inventory of every home. So the basement was not the source. The students 
who were working on this project, as well as the owners, complained about a very strong sewer gas odor. So we decided that what we could do is isolate the bathroom from the rest of the first floor and sample in there. And we did. We found imminent hazard concentrations of PCE in the bathroom coming from a faulty wax ring around the base of the toilet. Um, the lesson learned from this experiment where the basement and the remainder of the first floor appeared what we would expect in a situation like this, that the engineering solution that everyone thought would be enough for this exposure pathway was not sufficient. We had a really unusual pathway here that nobody anticipated, not the state, not the regulators, not the engineers who are experts in vapor intrusion. So we published a paper on the toilet with a, with a more attractive title. Um, and we developed this conceptual model of how volatile organic compounds enter the sewer through contaminated soil and contaminated groundwater, that water traps can be effective, but not always, and that sewer odors can be evidence of vapor intrusion, but not always. So before this study, there was no mention of the sewer pathway in the federal guidelines, nor in many state vapor intrusion documents. There was one previous report of a sewer to gas indoor air pathway in Denmark. Since then, the US EPA guidance that was eventually issued in 2015 includes the vapor, the sewer pathway, ATSDR's guidance, Several states, including most recently California, is acknowledging with, with the help not just of our study, but several studies and ongoing hazard assessments identifying soil and groundwater contaminated with volatile organics is getting into indoor air through this pathway. But also, there is some a lot to learn from our interdisciplinary collaboration. When I was recruiting residents, I told them that it would require drilling a two to four inch hole in their yard and in their basement. I had no idea that that would require jackhammers and even a pile driver to, to drill those holes. And the engineers couldn't believe that I thought we could drill holes any other way. So there's a really big miscommunication. You could see the our students got um, cardboard boxes from Home Depot to try and protect the yard from getting torn up. And in the end, everybody was okay with the results. Uh, we did learn that um, interdisciplinary communication really needs to be painstakingly clear. And the lead engineer on this project, I'm so proud to say, always says when she talks, she would never have had the courage to go down the toilet if she hadn't been working with public health scientists. Um, the next story of the outlet is a pilot study of portable air cleaner usage and particulate matter exposure reduction, actually in Chelsea, Massachusetts. And here are our co-authors. Um, this is not yet published. I will say, um, but as Patricia mentioned, this is um, the city of Chelsea here is shown with all the colors. Um, every single census block in the city meets one of the criteria for environmental justice populations. I should say one or more criteria for environmental justice populations as defined in the Climate Roadmap Bill um, that was passed in 2020. Um, and which is now threatened by the recent Supreme Court decision um, about taking into consideration race with any such um, policies. That aside, um, the city of Chelsea was really hard hit with the highest rates of COVID at the height of the pandemic. And we also rank very high for poor air quality, as well as third in the state for asthma related hospitalizations. And this photo of Nari from a report published by Green Roots, um, talks about the need for more air filters in our neighborhood. And what a lot of people have talked about is the need for low cost solutions to poor indoor air quality 
um, for tenants of rental housing who are often transient, but could bring their, their solution with them, if you will. And several of us have portable air cleaners that are like furniture, like shelves in our home. We don't use them. So just giving away air filters was not a solution without also studying usage. So in this study conducted in collaboration with the health clinic, we recruited um, residents. We gave them temperature sensors, HEPA filters, which they could keep after the study ended. We measured uh, real-time air quality of particulate matter in three sizes, and we did weekly surveys with them. Uh, eight households participated, mostly Spanish speakers, um, with reported asthma symptoms that interrupt their sleep approximately four times per week. What we learned is that the PAC usage really varied by participants. Um, so each of these is the eight participants. You can see number eight used the filter for the entire study period, and number seven used it only at nighttime. There were many reasons for the filter use being what it was. Um, overall, all sizes of particulate matter decreased when the filters were used regardless of day or nighttime. But what I want to talk about here, oh, sorry, and we also have a whole reporting of the results to participants and to the general community about if you have an air cleaner, why it's important to use it, and that the level of the filtration matters. Um, but here is an implement implementation challenge for um, illustrating some of the realistic conditions. Uh, which we did not anticipate is the loose plug, the loose outlet. This is fairly common. It's not only a fire hazard, but it makes it really difficult to plug things in and expect them to run. So we hired an electrician to fix and replace the plugs in the homes where we couldn't actually plug anything in and have it stay on. But then there is also the fact that in some of these homes, a lot of devices were being plugged into the same outlet and kids wanting to watch TV would plug out the filter so that they could watch TV, for example. So we ended up buying strips, power strips, which we probably should have done from the very beginning. And then this is just a side note. Um, something that was plugged in in almost every home I entered was an air freshener, an air cleaner. Um, and that was just a surprise to me because I, you know, we're thinking about cleaning the air with these filters. And meanwhile, this is happening and we were not prepared with any educational materials. There's definitely a conversation that could happen around this topic. And I think we'll talk about today. And then I'll just say the issue of the outlet really came up um, in earlier attempts to weatherize home, which we're revisiting in the context of cooling during the summertime, um, that weatherization cannot take place until certain physical requirements are met. I'm quoting from a, a report uh, published by Community Labor United that led a huge effort to weatherize over 450 homes in Massachusetts in the Boston area. Um, including prioritizing homes by low income tenants of buildings that they didn't own. So by the time this formal evaluation occurred of the 188 households that signed up for weatherization, only 27 had completed the process due to the challenges of dealing with structural issues that were unanticipated by the policies and opportunities that are meant to provide weatherization for low-income residents. So I'll end with one more slide. I've, I teach a course called Community Engaged Research, um, and I've been reading Bell Hook's book, Teaching Community, um, and just love this quote. When we teach with love, we are better able to respond to the unique concerns of individual students while simultaneously integrating those of the classroom community. And I think the same could be said for research. When we do research with love, responding to the unique concerns of individual study participants, we can really inform science and policy as it relates to preventing harmful exposures where we live, work, play, and worship.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Scammel, for that excellent talk. Please stay with us for our panel afterwards. Um, same for our online viewers. Please stay for the discussion afterwards. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michaela Martinez, who will be our next speaker. <clears throat> Dr. Well, ecologist and justice advocate Dr. Michaela Martinez is the Director of Environmental Health at We Act for Environmental Justice. She is responsible for advancing the organization's efforts to improve environmental health in communities of color and low-income communities by promoting public health awareness, education, coalition building, and advocacy. She earned her PhD in ecology and evolution and previously served as an assistant professor at Columbia University Mainman School of Public Health and Emory University. Her research has focused on infectious disease ecology, social justice, climate change, maternal and infant health, and environmental impacts on health. Dr. Martinez is currently leading We Act's Beauty Inside Out campaign, which seeks to remove toxic chemicals from beauty products, particularly products that enforce Eurocentric beauty standards and are marketed towards women of color. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Martinez. Thanks so much for being with us. Wonderful, thank you for having me. So let's get my slides pulled up. So today I've been tasked with um, bringing the topic of indoor exposures into the broader picture in discussing structural racism and I'll also talk a little bit about cumulative impacts. Okay, great. So before we can talk about justice, we kind of have to um, talk about some of the other words that have been um, quite popular these days, equity, equality, um, inequality. And so I really like this illustration um, using the example of the children's book, The Giving Tree. So when we think about equality, this is um, what we're talking about. So we have this tree that's leaning over. One child it has more access to the fruit on this tree and more opportunity. And then the other child is kind of left behind with less access. So that's inequality. But then what is equality? So if we recognize this unequal access and we said, okay, let's give these children um, more access to the tree, but let's do it um, equally, then we would give them each a ladder that was the same height. And even though we gave them an equivalent resource, it still didn't solve um, this problem. We see that now um, the child that's on the left still has more um, access to that fruit and the other child is still left behind even though they have that ladder. And then when we think about equity, then that would be fully acknowledging that one child needs a higher ladder in order to reach that fruit. Now, this has started to solve the problem a little bit um, in that now each ch both children have some access, but that tree is still leaning over and one child is still getting more. And that is where justice comes in. So justice is really the full acknowledgement that this is a broken tree. We're working in very broken and actually intentionally unjust systems. And so we need to write um, those structures. And so that's what social justice organizations um, like We Act for Environmental Justice, where I am based, that is what we try to do is to acknowledge um, these broken systems. And so, in the United States, um, we have many systems of structural racism, and I'm going to um, try to give you a little bit more context and how we frame structural racism. So a really um, useful definition of structural racism is a totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination via mutually reinforcing inequitable systems. And I underline mutually reinforcing inequitable systems because these systems feed into each other. And these include community disinvestment, the criminal legal system, um, disparities in our education system, housing system, and all of these systems work together to reinforce each other and generate cumulative impacts. 
And so we'll get a little bit deeper into that. So all of us here care about the environment. Today we're focused on the indoor environment, <clears throat> but environmental racism generally, whether it's indoor or outdoors kills, um, particularly in the United States. And I just wanted to throw a couple um, stats up here just so that we're all on the same page in terms of how we think about environmental racism. Um, so environmental racism is just one of these systems of structural racism. And in the US, people of color are 61% more likely than white people to live in a county with at least one failing grade um, for air pollution. And a really shocking statistic is that um, based on data from 2020, black children have an asthma death rate that's 7.6 times higher than white children. And oftentimes when you give um, stats like these, people um, who are skeptical of um, structural racism will say, well, isn't it all about income? And no, it's not. There are fairly strong um, correlations between income and racial and ethnic background in the United States, but income is not the sole driver of these disparities because in fact, if you control for income, uh, black and Latino households in the United States even income matched with white households are still um, overburdened by environmental pollution. And so I, I work in New York City and in New York City, um, we have quite diverse um, set of communities going from extremely affluent, predominantly white communities to highly underserved um, communities of color. And so here, just to give you a hyper-local example of New York, of how extreme these disparities can be, um, what I plotted here along the x-axis is the percent of the population in each of our community districts, which are neighborhoods um, that is non-white. So we have, towards the left, um, predominantly white populations. And then as you move towards the right, these are predominantly communities of color. And some neighborhoods in New York City are over 95% people of color. And what I plotted on the y-axis is the childhood asthma ER visit rate. And this is even a, um, controlling for the number of children. And what you see is that when we move from predominantly white communities to communities of color, there's an exponentially higher rate of childhood asthma. And so <clears throat> this is all within one jurisdiction. We all live in the state of New York. We all live under the same laws in the city of New York, but you can still see these disparities arise. And when it comes to health disparities and um, structural racism in general, they manifest throughout the entire life course, all the way from in utero until the day that people die. And here, what I'm showing is health disparities across the life course with infant mortality as it relates um, to racial demographics in New York City, you can see that um, strong linear relationship, higher childhood obesity in communities of color, higher diabetes, higher premature uh, mortality rates. So these things are manifesting all throughout the life course. And in terms of um, considering these health disparities, the way that I like to think of health disparities is they're essentially like an oil rig. So you see these um, massive oil rigs that sit on the top of the ocean and you see this big ugly thing sitting there. Um, but what we don't often see is this huge infrastructure that's actually under the water and hidden. And this is like a health disparity. At the very top, we see this like ugly thing that we can see and measure and such, but underneath it is that system of environmental and structural racism that's really the root cause. And so we act and other justice organizations fully acknowledge that um, these disparities and these systems are man-made and so therefore they are um, disruptable. And when it comes to these household exposures, um, that we're all um, interested in here today, they fit into this much bigger network. And so this image is um, to try to show you how we can conceptualize structural racism. So we have structural racism in the middle, and we have this ring of systems of structural racism. So that includes the environment, the external environment, like um, air pollution, um, 
urban heat islands. We have indoor exposures, like uh, household from household exposures, food systems, um, the criminal legal system, the education system. And so all of those systems that have um, disparities within them, they're all interconnected, mutually reinforcing each other. And then they feed into the disparities that are looped around the outside. And those can include things like disparities in cancer rates, infant mortality rates, um, <clears throat> diseases that come from um, endocrine dysfunction, social stress, financial insecurity, et cetera. And the way that um, the Environmental Protection Agency is starting to frame a lot of this is kind of breaking up these different uh, exposures into chemical and non-chemical exposures and thinking about how these chemical and non-chemical exposures come together to generate cumulative impacts, which are those health disparities. And so today we're gonna to talk about those household exposures. And so I wanted to give you just two little vignettes of um, work that we've done at WE ACT in terms of indoor exposure. So first I'm gonna talk about our Be Inside Out campaign and then our Out of Gas In With Justice um, campaign. And so be the Beauty and Sad Act campaign, um, which I lead, is really addressing the issue of toxic chemicals in beauty and personal care products. So there are two main problems with toxic chemical with beauty and personal care products and their toxicity. One is that they cause physical, biological harm to our health, and two that there is highly racialized marketing and um, kind of colonial um, Eurocentric standards that are at the core of marketing um, beauty products and their particular products that are um, marketed towards women of color that are highly toxic, that are not only causing biological harm, but actually psychological and societal harm. And so we're trying to address both of these things. And the way we're trying to do this is two ways, um, both with top down, so like getting at the regulation at the international, federal, and state level, and then bottom up, doing grassroots organizing and education so that we can not only uh, address those societal and deep-rooted um, psychological harms, but we can also get at the um, get at the companies through regulation. And so um, just to reiterate that cosmetics that are marketed and to women of color and created for women of color are notorious for having some of the most toxic ingredients. And so these include things like chemical hair straighteners and skin lighteners. So skin lighteners are particularly bad because they oftentimes contain mercury because mercury is a very efficient blocker of melanin production in the skin. So from data that um, we've received from various public health um, organizations in the United States, we see that about a quarter of skin lighteners that have been sampled by the state of California, the state of Minnesota, um, and also New York contain mercury in them. And so these are very, very hazardous because mercury is a neurotoxin. And then, um, as many of you have probably seen on the news, um, hair relaxers, also known as hair straighteners, um, oftentimes um, contain very high levels of formaldehyde, which is a carcinogen. And also for formaldehyde can have other um, reproductive um, health impacts. And the other thing to know, oh, and I will go back to that, is both of these products, hair straighteners and skin lighteners, they are their creation and existence is centered in white beauty standards and racism, shadism, and colorism. And so that's why they serve as a good example for this kind of dual toxicity. And then these products are incredibly prevalent in our community. So um, this picture here is a front window of a beauty supply store that's about three blocks um, from my apartment in Harlem. And as you can see, all of the shelves are just full of skin lighteners. And then here um, to the left, I'm showing just like a quick 
cap of if you do an Amazon search for hair straighteners, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get products that are all directly marketed to women of color and also products that are marketed to children um, that actually have um, young girls of color on their front cover, knowing that these are incredibly um, dangerous products. And so a study that um, we had conducted as part of our Beauty Inside Out campaign was a survey of women and femme identifying individuals that live in Upper Manhattan to ask about not only their use of chemical hair straighteners and skin lighteners, but also ask about what are some of the societal pressures um, that drive individuals to use these products. And I would say the average person um, that I've encountered is usually pretty surprised about how widely used skin lighteners are. They're incredibly widely used and it is a very rapidly growing international um, industry. And what we ended up finding is that 25% of our survey respondents, we had um, 297 um, participants enrolled in the survey, 25% had used skin lighteners. And among Asian respondents, it was um, 57%. So this is a large fraction of individuals. And then when it came to chemical hair straighteners, 44% of respondents had used chemical hair straighteners and when we looked at non-Hispanic Black respondents, um, it was 60%. Uh, so these are very widely used products, even if they're not widely talked about. And one of the interesting things that came out of this survey, not only in terms of um, you know, getting information about of the um, prevalence of use, was also why people use these products. And it wasn't that individ individuals weren't reporting that they were using chemical hair straighteners and skin lighteners because they thought it made them more beautiful. It was that they perceived that others would believe that they were more beautiful, desirable, professional, or youthful if they use those products. And so what that shows is that the beauty norms that we set and the beauty expectations that we set for those around us really impact our exposures and our product use. And I think that um, this is really important when it comes to why um, community-based research is so so is so important. Um, because we might naively assume that people use these products because it makes them feel better about themselves, but that's actually not the case. And so this really gives us key insights into why these products are being used in the first place. And I just wanted to check on my time. Can you tell me how many more minutes I have? And, and so we are using this information uh, because being an environmental justice organization, we um, take advocacy very seriously. So we are doing advocacy on the international level, the federal level, um, and also at the state level to pass new regulation um, to improve, um, to try to achieve beauty justice, essentially. Um, so at the international level, we're supporting the Minamata Convention on Mercury um, to not only um, have the ban of import and export of mercury containing skin lighteners, which is currently in place, but also to ban the sale, the display of sale and advertising of mercury um, containing skin lighteners. And then on the federal level, um, we've been working to promote the Safer Beauty Bills package, which is a set of four um, beauty bills. One of these bills will increase resources for research into exposures for women of color and then also salon workers. And then at the state level, we have two new bills, one that would do a chemical ban for some of our most harmful chemical and beauty chemicals and beauty products, and then also um, require labeling disclosure for menstrual products. And then just with my last couple minutes, I wanted to um, talk about our Out of Gas and In With Justice um, program. This was a pilot program and we're hoping to expand this in the near future. <clears throat> But the motivation um, for this study was um, that it's been long known that um, the use of gas stoves in homes can produce nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide, with nitrogen dioxide being harmful to respiratory health and carbon monoxide particularly bad um, for cardiovascular illness. 
And one of the reasons that um, we act as interested in this um, pilot specifically was because of the link between um, gas stoves and childhood asthma. So there have been population level studies that have attributed um, up to 18.8% of childhood asthma in New York state to the presence of gas stoves in homes. And based on those data that I had showed you earlier, we have such a big problem um, with childhood asthma disparities that it made um, a study like this um, desirable to see if we actually got rid of gas stoves in homes, would that improve the conditions inside the home? And so this was the first study um, of its kind that um, did stove swap outs gas for induction in a public housing setting with the actual tenants in place in their homes. And I just wanted to show you um, a couple like snippets of data from this, one of the things that we did um, was to actually do the swap out from the gas to induction stove and then did a controlled cooking experiment where um, we cooked a standardized meal, spaghetti with tomato sauce, broccoli and chocolate chip cookies. And in each home, um, this cooking was done three times before the gas stove swap out and then three replicated three times after the gas stove swap out to look at the differences. And then um, we, here I'm just showing some data for one home, what the a controlled cooking experiment looked like when um, the gas was being used to cook. So what you have on the x-axis is time after we started the cooking um, in minutes, and then we have the nitrogen dioxide um, levels on the y-axis. So what you could see, and also this orange line is showing the unhealthy levels um, for sensitive groups for nitrogen dioxide levels that's set for EPA based on like outdoor um, outdoor air, but this is indoor. And so what we see is within the first 10 minutes of cooking with a gas stove, those nitrogen dioxide levels shoot up above those unhealthy levels. Um, but if you do the same cooking experiment with an induction stove, you don't see um, that same unhealthy increase. And we can, um, we've shown this across multiple homes. So we have here, these data are showing um, three homes where we did the stove swap outs and then compared to three homes um, where we didn't um, do this swap outs. And you could see the background levels of um, nitrogen dioxide before cooking and then after cooking, jumping up with those gas stoves and then um, just kind of staying flat when you're using an induction stove. And so what this is really telling us is that um, having those gas stoves in homes can get us to those unhealthy levels for um, nitrogen dioxide. And we really need to do follow-up studies where we can actually measure is the intervention helping to improve health outcomes. So that's where we're at with it now. And we have a um, EPA grant in under review now to do a hundred house swap out. Um, these were done with 20 homes total, but these controlled cooking experiments were only done in six of the apartments. Um, but just the last thing that I wanted to say was one reason it was so important to work with the community is you learn a lot. So a couple of things we learned, you have to buy new pots and pans for everybody when you swap out someone's stove. You have to be very respectful when you come in and have to do electrical rewiring in people's houses because there's actually a lot of electrical work that needs to be done to do this kind of swap out. Um, but also people really love their stoves. So we had um, professional cooks do cooking classes that were culturally appropriate for um, our participants and they ended up really loving their stoves. And I will just leave you um, with this QR code where you can watch a video of our participants talking about how much they love their stoves. And I think you'll find it um, just really lovely at seeing how surprising it is um, that, yeah, people were very happy with this transition. And it is a very big win for us because this was done in um, public housing. And now New York City has committed, New York City Public Housing, referred to as NYCHA, has committed to doing a 10,000 stove swap out in 10,000 public housing apartments. So, yep, and that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Martinez. That was excellent. Um, and now I would like to ask, thank you, Dr. 
Dr. Scam will be online. So we just heard excellent talks. Thank you both so much. Um, we have a Q&A session right now. So we see Dr. Scam online and Dr. Martinez is right here with us. Um, I have plenty of questions that I'd love to pick our speakers' brains on, but maybe before we get started, if anyone has a question from the audience, please step up to the microphone. I'll start us off with an online question from Dr. Miriam Shakon, and thank you for being with us. Um, basically, she is a thanking you, Dr. Scammell, for your presentation in regards from Stuttgart, from Germany. Her question is, if it is known that these beauty products are so dangerous, why are they still available in the market? And actually, I think Dr. Scammell answered that this is really the topic of Dr. Martinez. But the sad truth is beauty products are not tested for chemical safety. But I would also love to open it up to Dr. Martinez for your personal thoughts on this question. And then Dr. Scammell, if you want to add anything as well. Yeah, so there's been research um, from the Lake Research Partners here in the United States that has shown that the majority of Americans believe um, incorrectly that uh, personal care products are tested for safety before they hit our shelves, and that's just not true. Um, and the reason for that is because our federal government has just not stood up to regulate the personal care and beauty industry. You know, we're really behind um, in this if you look at um, regulations in the European Union and also Canada, um, they are light years ahead of us. So here in the United States, we're still fighting for banning you know, the dirty dozen chemicals. Whereas if you look um, at the EU, they have over a thousand chemicals. I think they're now over 2000 chemicals um, that are banned from beauty and personal care products. So it's really, in my view, a problem of our regulation and federal government. Dr. Scammell, do you want to add anything to this? No, I think that was very well said and accurate. So I would love both our speakers' thoughts on this next. Um, I'm going to follow Gillian's excellent example and editorialize a little bit. I feel like whenever we're talking about environmental health disparities, sorry, Robin, I just noticed you're there. We'll go to you next. Um, you know, we focus a lot, rightly so, on the sort of uneven burden of exposures and the multitudes of very specific types of exposures that these communities are experiencing very high concentrations of, right? What we don't focus as much on is the double jeopardy, I think you noted, or the double toxicity, which is the vulnerability side of things, meaning even if these communities were experiencing the same levels, and they're not, of course, they are still at higher risk of developing adverse health effects from these same exposures because of the multitudes of chronic stressors and lack of resources uh, and issues that, are, that make them at higher risk. What, in your sort of personal opinion, you know, why is this sort of aspect of vulnerability usually ignored in the conversation, perhaps, or paid less attention to? And what do you think is at the heart of strengthening that side of the equation? Sure, I'll start. <clears throat> so I think that one of the problems with acknowledging both the social stressors and non-chemical exposures alongside the chemical exposures is silence. science has just been done too siloed. You have um, people in environmental health sciences that are looking at exposures. You have epidemiologists that are looking at infectious and chronic diseases. You have like, you know, the reproductive health folks, like everybody's working in a silo. The social scientists who are doing a great job at looking at um, social stressors, but we've not been intentionally trained to integrate all of those data and all of those different ways of thinking. And so it's, um, I think it's a, a kind of a structural issue of how science has been done. Madeline. Thank you. 
Yeah, I agree. And I would just expand on that by saying, I think what we have been trained to do is to believe that we can objectively measure the truth with quantitative metrics um, that would somehow be representative of the entire population um, and make decisions based on what is best for the white normal male, which is not accurate. And um, so we have to learn how to, to incorporate all of these different types of information, as Dr. Martinez said, um, using new methods and, and taking into consideration different ways of knowing about the world than we have historically. Thank you very much. And I see Dr. Dotson has a question for us from the room. Please go ahead. Sure. Um, well, thank you both, uh, Madeline and Michaela, um, for these talks. Both of you touched on something, and I'm I'm putting not on my community-based participatory research hat, but more from just a research scientist who's trying to get things funded hat. Um, you both pointed out implementation challenges, and I noted, you know, Madeline, you um, talked about having to do redo electrical work and things like that in homes, and Michaela, you also brought up having to like redo electrical work, uh, providing pots and pans. I'm trying to think as we're developing these intervention strategies where we try to make it palatable to funders and to others who, who might support this work to say, all you have to do is swap out a stove. But then you imagine there's actually these outsized costs on the implementation of it. And I'm just wondering how you've worked on trying to make those, well, first of all, have you tried to estimate them or kind of package them as part of the intervention in a way that's palatable for funders or, or just kind of programmatically? Yeah, so um, I'll say with our expansion of the out of gas project, you know, I put very clearly like in my EPA budget, this is what it's gonna cost for me to hire like a culturally appropriate cook. I'm gonna have cooking classes. I need to have like a little test stove there. I budgeted, I think it was like $130 a household for new cookware. And I just, I mean, I'm used to running like a very traditional science lab and I'm used to being like, here's what it's gonna cost for all of like my pipette tips and all these things, like things that are actually necessary to do the science. And I see this as the exact same way. It's like, I know what I need to get this done the right way. And I guess maybe a little naively on my side, I'm like, the funders should understand that um, because it's just, you know, that's just what it has to be. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I haven't yet heard back. I don't know if I'm going to receive pushback from like being so, you know, just frank about it, but I think that we should probably expect that um, level of understanding from our granting agencies. I would just add to that, that, um, well, ours was a pilot study and we definitely learned a lot. We did not anticipate those challenges, um, which was perhaps naive because then when we went to go look at people's experience with weatherization, we learned that these challenges had previously been documented, but in a different context. Um, but I think uh, definitely those line items would go into a future grant. But I also think that like policies, like we're sort of at an impasse, like right now everybody recognizes that weatherization is really important for homes, for heating efficiency and cooling efficiency. But people just keep grinding the same tool in terms of saying, getting out there and trying to take advantage of the same programs that do not allow for these changes or do not provide the funding for or facilitate the changes that require landlord and tenant engagement. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that's, I guess we're sort of at the interface of our research with policy and solutions and trying to in mutually influence each other. You both again, um, have a question online. Let me try to phrase that first and then I have some thoughts. Um, we've had a couple of questions actually to Dr. Martinez on any research or articles that you could potentially share on the dangers of hair strengtheners and skin lighteners. Um, and I'm sure you probably have a long list. So if you don't mind maybe sharing with us some resources on where to. Yeah, 
on your website or any other recommendations? Uh, so you can go to um, weact.org and the Beauty Inside Out website. There should be on there um, a link to our recent publication in Let's see. Oh, sorry. The, there should be a link um, on there to our most recent article, which covers the hair straighteners and skin lighteners. And in those references, uh, links to other scientific articles on the topic. Um, also, there was the recent um, study that was looking at hormone sensitive cancers. Oh, my mic keeps cutting out. Um, and yes, also if you just Google hair straighteners and cancer, you're gonna see the, some very recent articles that have come out. So much. Sorry, I couldn't be better from the podium with providing links. No, it's okay, and we'll... Possible. Um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll just keep running with the mics. Um, So Dr. Miriam Diamond, who's also participating in our workshop, has a comment on hazardous personal care products. And if you don't mind unmuting, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much, Rima. Thank you very much for both your really informative uh, presentations. Um, I was aware of a, a project done in Toronto in which uh, researchers were looking at personal care products that immigrants often brought with them that were very that could be very hazardous and then completely uh, eluded any regulatory scrutiny because they were brought by community members uh, with, for example, elevated levels of mercury, cadmium, uh, and some other very nasty compounds. I believe in Canada that some that at least uh, some personal care products are subject to the um, uh, cosmetics regulation, but it's very challenging for um, immigrant communities that have um, cultural norms that include the use of specific products. It's not a question, just a comment. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And this is, well, two things to say. Um, toxic beauty products are a global issue. So this is not something that um, is just a US problem. We need very coordinated global efforts um, to address this. But also this is a reason why um, I had mentioned that we're also taking this bottom up approach, where which is like a grassroots approach to have conversations um, with community members about you know why we choose to um, use certain personal care and beauty products or um, and, and thinking about that when it comes to like culture, family, um, and California Department of Public Health has done a really great job um, of addressing the use of skin lighteners among um, women farm workers in California. And, you know, one of the things that they see there is there are skin lighteners that are sold in like swap meats um, where they'll have mercury added into them. And they believe that this is coming from like the artisanal gold mining mercury that's also used um, throughout uh, Mexico and Latin America. So you have to really address like where this mercury is in the environment, the cultural aspects, where people are buying them, and you have to take a really holistic approach. Um, and so, yeah, that's why this community-driven like conversations are really important. Thank you very much. I I also have a um, a chlorinated solvent story to share. If if please go ahead. <laughs> I I didn't want to leave out Madeline, um, but um. Uh, Bill Doucette, uh, formerly at the University of ne no, Nevada State in Logan, Utah, um, had done some, uh, was looking for houses affected by vapor intrusion of TCE um, as a result of military um, activity, uh, the military base, but actually found um, the smoking gun, so to speak with some um, imported Christmas ornaments that had been, <laughs> that were just loaded with TCE. Um, and also when you bring in garments from um, uh, dry cleaning, they just degas over time. And 
impossible to keep track of Christmas ornaments and dry clothes, dry cleaning clothes and everything. Um, Dr. Scammell, I think we wanted your thoughts on vapor intrusion, perhaps related issues along these lines and examples, if you have any, of course. Um, along the lines of just, it's an exposure pathway that we don't often consider or vapor intrusion generally. Um, Sorry, Madeline, I think perhaps it was hard to hear. I, I guess Dr. Diamond was giving more examples of, let's say, unintentional ways. Sometimes these chemical products are introduced into the home um, and trying to give you an example because you talked about TCE. Um, so it, it's, it's fine if you don't have any thoughts, to be honest, because we could move to Dr. Fabien, but I just wanted to make sure we give you the opportunity. Thank you, online. I think. Yeah, I think there are a lot of products that we bring into our home. That's exactly right. And dry cleaning clothes and a lot of situations where people living near dry cleaners or near auto body shops are exposed to many of the same chemicals through their their own air building air intake system. Um, but also just to consider all of the leaking underground storage tanks in the country, wherever there's a gas station and all of the hazardous sites that are managed at the state level and not at the federal level, there's a range of approaches to monitoring and assessing health risks that often doesn't include some real now known pathways. Um, so I'm just saying, I sealed the toilet to my basement and and will ever after now um with the notion with the knowledge that what comes up from the, from the sewer includes many chemicals even if you don't live on a hazardous waste site so much um dr patricia fabian has a question from the audience hi thank you both um question for both of you actually around the cost of the implementation of these interventions so Portable air cleaners add to the electricity bill. Swapping out the gas stove switches the cost from a fuel heating bill to an electricity bill, which maybe goes from the landlord to the tenant. We talked a bit about this at lunch. So can you talk about the challenges with the sustainability of these interventions once we've proven that they work and that this might be a, a solution somehow? Um, how do we then um, implement them in environmental justice communities where the you know any tweaks to the bills are a big uh, challenge? Yeah, absolutely. So you're correct that anytime that we're making modifications to the home, we really have to consider the cost to um, the residents and be particularly sensitive when we're working with um, lower income communities. I will say that this also has to be balanced by the cost of unhealthy homes. Um, and so we we need to be able to provide safety nets, whether that's through actual like cash incentives or, you know, reductions to utility bills and such um, that are sustainable, but also recognizing that we need to have a broader conversation about public health and the cost that it's not just costing individuals, but like also our, you know, infrastructure, like our health infrastructure to keep people. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it, I think the cost goes beyond like how much does my electric bill or utility bill go up at the end of the month, but we really need to kind of factor in like, how is this impacting, is intervention impacting your um, chronic diseases and your medical bills, et cetera, or even, you know, your well-being is so important for school attendance and um, job maintenance, et cetera. So that's why I really think we have to take these very, very big picture holistic approaches. Okay. Agree. Thanks. I would just say that for the portable air cleaner study, we gave participants um, money to supplement their utility bill as well, um, far more than the actual cost of using the um, filter, as it turned out. But agree that this is really an upstream concern and that um, we need to make landlords and homeowners um, responsible for making their 
home easier to heat and cool without increasing the cost to the tenants who live there. Um, and also without resulting in gentrification of an area because their um, homes have been improved upon and can be rented for more rent. And I also wanted to make one other note um, because this also the cost also comes up with the beauty justice work because transitioning to non-toxic and safer beauty products is also really expensive. Um, and so that's something that you know we're having conversations about as act, as advocates, like how do we make like cleaner beauty more affordable? Like how do you help, like do you need to in, help brands to be able to clean beauty brands to be able to scale up so that they can offer non-toxic products for more affordable? Like it's the cost thing comes into play in multiple arenas. Much we are at time, but Gillian, do you do you want to give a quick comment or question? Just, just to the point, and thank you, Rima. I'll, I'll do this in ninety seconds or less. Um, the idea that we we need to incentivize property managers, property owners, landlords, residents. I just want to point out that our entire federal tax structure is designed to incentivize home ownership. And if you have filed your taxes and you're a homeowner, you get to a you know, tax deduction for every interest, every dollar you've paid in your mortgage interest. That's just our tax code designed to incentivize a middle class, right? So changing our tax codes so that we can incentivize property owners to make, as I call it, Medicaid neutral housing, right? To do those things, I don't think is an insurmountable task. I think we just need to start having that conversation. So that's my nice. And I'll just say, given you know the history of redlining and the home ownership gap, it has to be recognize the very intentional um, blocks that have been put in place in this country to keep people of color from being homeowners and therefore being able to benefit from some of those tax incentives. Thank you both so much for bringing us back to this sort of systems level thinking and how everything ties into everything. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Diamond. We don't have time, so we're going to go to break in two seconds. But I just also want to thank both our speakers for excellent talks, but also for bringing in issues around culture and how sort of, you know, people's behavior sometimes or products they use or practices they, they have in their homes are very culturally driven and how you've both given great examples of how to approach that in a very intentional and culturally appropriate way. So thank you both so much. Thanks to our online audience. We are out of time. We're two minutes over actually. We're going to go to break now for eight minutes precisely. And if you don't mind, please be back at 2.20 p.m. Eastern for us to start back on time. And thank you all so much again for your engagement and wonderful talks. Thank you. All right, we are gonna resume session three. And um, I should have said this before, but I also want to thank and introduce Dr. Ellison Carter, who was part of the planning team, and um, happy to hear that she can be here with us virtually today. She was going to be in person, but had jury duty. Um, so I'm going to introduce Dr. Carter first, and then we'll move right into the speakers in our session. So Ellison Carter is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Colorado State University. Dr. Carter has expertise in indoor air quality, exposure science, and indoor environments as places that support health and well-being. She conducts field-based assessments of personal indoor and outdoor air quality and human behaviors and the impacts of intervention in the home and workplace settings. Her research aims to contribute to the development and implementation of healthy housing and indoor environmental interventions in diverse domestic and international settings. She earned her PhD in civil engineering, focused on indoor environmental science and engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Her work as a JPB Foundation and Harvard Environmental Health Fellow broadened her research, teaching, and professional efforts to further integrate social and environmental factors as they relate to public health. Pause there before I introduce our first speaker in session. And is she gonna be visible? Do we have her? coming out of the stratosphere somewhere. Ellison, I thought she was gonna be on camera. Just so we moderate, okay. 
Um, all right, so you guys have made it to the third session and we have just fantastic speakers all day. So I'm excited for this conversation. Um, this particular component is called Perspectives on Air Cleaning Products, Air Sensors, and the Impacts on EJ Communities. Um, our first speaker for session three is uh, Dr. No. Yes, I'm reading from the wrong agenda. Uh, apologize, or from, or I'm just misreading the agenda. All right. However, so session two is just as good. <laughs> this session two is focusing on community engagement approaches for research, practice, and policy on EJ considerations for indoor air chemistry. And our first speaker is Dr. Robin Dodson. All good so far? Okay. She is an exposure scientist at Silent Spring Institute and an adjunct assistant professor, professor at Boston University School of Public Health. Her research focuses on three main areas, development of novel exposure measurements for epidemiological and community-based studies, analysis of environmental exposure data with particular emphasis on semi-volatile organic compounds, and interventions aimed at reducing chemical exposures. Dr. Dodson investigates environmental exposures of chemicals linked to a range of health outcomes, including asthma, altered neurological and reproductive development, and breast cancer. Her current research focuses on exposure to consumer product chemicals such as phthalates and flame retardant chemicals, and has been used to identify exposure sources and implement effective exposure reduction strategies in homes. Dr. Dodson serves as the chair of the Massachusetts Toxic Use Reduction Institute's Science Advisory Board and is an associate editor of the Journal of Exposure Science and Environmental Epidemiology. Dr. Dodson completed her doctorate in environmental health and master's in environmental science and risk ma management, excuse me, at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. All right. So, you. Wonderful. Um, well, it is my pleasure today to talk to you about some of my research on uh, making homes healthier um, and particularly doing that within partnership with communities. Um, so what I'd like to start off actually is to elevate uh, what Dr. Fabian had already talked about today, uh, moving environmental justice indoors. Um, and thinking really a lot of my research is kind of in that space around sources and exposures, particularly indoor sources. Um, and then the activity patterns um, that can kind of modify some of those sources. Um, in particular, I'm gonna be focusing on consumer product chemicals. And what I mean by consumer product chemicals, I'm using that term very broadly. I'm thinking about things like cleaning products and personal care products. I'm thinking about things like furnishings or household goods that we could bring into the home. I'm also considering um, building materials, the materials in which we build our homes. These include things like phthalates, preservatives and antimicrobials, UV filters, also includes things like uh, flame retardants, PFAS or PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, and even fragrances. These chemicals, um, many of which unfortunately um, are endocrine active, that means that they could affect our endocrine or hormone systems in some way, and some have even been linked with cancer. Many of them are also considered to be semi-volatile organic compounds. Um, and this is actually an, a visual from the report um, and uh, demonstrating really the complexity um, of these chemicals. They're semi-volatile. They love to readily partition between various surfaces. They can be found in air, they can be found in dust, um, they can be found on us. Um, and this complexity, um, is, you know, kind of makes my job fun, um, but it, it's difficult. Um, it means that um, we have to develop these models to try to understand the relationship. And these models are often based on the physical chemical properties. Um, Charlie Weschler and Bill Nazaroff have done an incredible amount of work in this space trying to characterize this partitioning behavior. Um, but the advantage here um, to this complexity is that it actually gives us different places to actually readily measure exposures. 
Um, and this is important. I think the flexibility that those semi-volatiles offer um, in terms of measurement um, makes them more flexible and more amenable maybe to con uh, con community-based work. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. So at Sound Spring Institute, um, we've done uh, we've collected hundreds and hundreds of indoor samples, um, largely in homes. Uh, that work actually started way back with the, uh, the Cape Cod um, uh, household exposure study um, over two decades ago, when Silent Spring was really the first to measure many of these semi-volatile organic compounds in homes in the United States. We were the first to measure flame retardants, for example. This work was community-based. The reason we were doing this work um, was trying to actually identify environmental contributors to elevated rates of breast cancer in Cape Cod. And that the attention was called to those issues and um, by, sorry, the attention was called to the, those issues by breast cancer activists living in Massachusetts, who actually, when traditional risk factors could not explain the elevated rates on Cape Cod, they wanted to fund and secure the funds for a research institute to tackle this problem, um, it, to look for environmental contributors to disease, uh, specifically breast cancer. So our work started um, in this community-based way, um, really uh, trying to uh, understand and then respond to community concerns about the environmental links to cancer. We then expanded this work into California um, with our California Household Exposure Study. Um, this study was also community-based in that it actually came out of concerns about a community that was living in Richmond, California, next to the largest oil refinery in uh, the country. Um, and residents were very concerned about the impact of the refinery um, on uh, their exposures inside of their homes. Um, so we looked, um, we collected air samples as well as dust samples in California as well. We've continued this work in low-income housing, uh, subsidized housing in Boston. We've looked in college campuses. We've done um, sampling in uh, CDC's Green Housing Study, which is um, subsidized housing with asthmatic children in Boston, Cincinnati, and New Orleans, and have since co uh, continued to collect these samples um, across the country. So what are we finding? Well, these consumer product chemicals are readily found in our homes um, and they love to hang out in dust, right? They're semi-volatile. Um, so house dust is one place they're gonna hang out. This is actually um, a summary table from a study that was part of a meta-analysis that we did a couple of years ago um, that was looking across the United States as household dust studies, um, finding that uh, phthalates in particular were um, found in every single home that's pretty much ever studied. I always find phthalates in homes. Flame retardants were very abundant. Um, and even things like phenols or fragrance chemicals um, were also found um, in these homes. This is actually plotting the geometric mean from that meta-analysis of all the different chemicals. The chemicals are listed on the bottom here with the geometric means um, you can see on the y-axis. And what I want to point out here is actually the range across which we see these chemical exposures. These are just the geometric medians, um, but I want to point out kind of the orders of magnitude over which we typically see these um, chemicals. And that phthalates typically are found at some of the higher levels, and maybe those PFAS tend to be found at the lower levels, not saying anything here about risk necessarily or potential health impacts, um, but that you can see this range um, over which we are observing these chemicals in household dust. When the chemicals are in dust, they're not alone. Um, in fact, we find them as chemical mixtures in dust. This is data coming from our um, some of our, our work on college campuses. Um, and this is looking at dust collected from classrooms on colleges. Um, and we did a, a, a principal component analysis to try to understand how some of these chemicals um, are highly correlated with each other. And then what mixtures might be associated with some of the characteristics of the space. So we found a significant association between the presence of wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in classrooms and elevated or higher levels of a mixture of PFAS chemicals. Um, so this is really important. We're starting to identify how these could work together um, to actually um, uh, to identify associations between building characteristics. We found these chemicals in dust. We also find them in indoor air. This is data coming from our uh, uh, the green housing study. So this is a CDC funded study where we added on additional measurements. 
Um, and this is for the triclosan, parabens, and phthalates. Um, these are indoor air concentrations. The reason I'm showing this is because I want to demonstrate the variability that we see within each chemical, right? DEP, diethyl phthalate found on the bottom there, um, spans orders of magnitude in terms of the levels that we're seeing. Um, this is, um, it's important when we're thinking about um, what are some of the sources, because I see this actually as an opportunity. This exposure variability allows us to really kind of target some of those higher levels that we're seeing to try to work back and try to use that, um, like, why are they much higher than others, um, to try to understand what are potential sources um, inside of these spaces. This is, um, I want to tell you a little bit about a study that we conducted in um, Boston, Massachusetts in subsidized housing. Um, this is what we call the move-in study. So we spent, you know, 15 years or so characterizing the levels of these chemicals in homes. Now we want to kind of move towards trying to identify, well, where are they coming from? Because that's how we're going to develop interventions. So this is what we call the move-in study. Um, we collected um, uh, measurements, uh, indoor air measurements inside of homes before people moved in and then after they moved in to subsidized housing units. All of these units were um, uh, renovated to uh, specific certifications. Um, and then we went back post-occupancy. What we then did was to compare the levels pre and post occupancy to basically bin these chemicals. Are they more building related? So they were there with once the building was renovated, but before the people were there, or are they from um, the occupants? Are they bringing the chemicals in with them? So first let's look at those chemicals that are influenced by the building. Um, I'll draw out a few examples here. Toluene and xylene, these are VOCs that are often used in building materials. Um, you can see that the levels left is um, pre, the right is post occupancy, um, and that the levels go down um, significantly over that time. Um, and this is important because we can start thinking about, okay, well, we know these VOCs must be in the building materials. We can work with certifiers, um, especially if these are actually attempting to be kind of green building certified. Um, this is uh, results for uh, benzophenone. Um, this was actually a surprise. Benzophenone is a UV filter typically considered to be in consumer products or personal care products. Um, this was a surprise. I would have beforehand put this in the other the other bin, not, not building related, but occupant related. Um, and my uh, I suspect that this is actually coming from paints um, to make that color last long, um, that they are putting these um, UV filters in um, in paints. These are flame retardant chemicals. These are chlorinated organophosphate flame retardants, TCIPP and TDCIPP. These um, uh, can be found in uh, building, uh, building insulation, but I want to point out that there's a few points up here where clearly these are being brought in by occupants as well. Um, so maybe this is a mixture on, on kind of on average, we would put this in the building material um, bin, um, although certainly some occupants are bringing this in. Now, why do I care? Why do I care if these chemicals, if I'm slotting these into the building materials um, spot? Um, uh, the reason for that is because it, it informs our interventions. These chemicals, um, uh, that I'm showing are all chemicals that you would then say target for intervention by di working directly with um, building material uh, companies, you'd work with construction, you'd work with third party certifications, things like that. In contrast, these are the chemicals that are related to occupancy. This is where chemical levels typically went up um, with occupancy. Um, First of all, there's chemicals that we didn't even detect before people moved in, and then suddenly we're detecting them. Um, these include things like uh, methylene chloride, which is a highly toxic solvent, um, chloroform, and then some of these um, lower brominated flame retardant chemicals. So clearly residents are bringing these chemicals in with them. These HTN and HHCB are synthetic fragrances. Um, no surprise here. Um, not surprised at all that these would be occupancy re related. Um, they are clearly brought in by participants and look at the levels um, are spanning um, quite a range there. This is triclosan. Triclosan can be used in building materials. Um, it's an antimicrobial. Um, it's a thyroid disruptor. Um, 
at this time of this study, it is now, uh, it was still being used in toothpaste, hand soaps, and other, other things. Um, those have actually been phased, those uses have been phased out, um, but can also be found in things like cutting boards, scissor handles, other places inside the home. And here we have BDE-47. This is a flame retardant that was phased out in uh, 2005. Um, these uh, samples were collected about 10 years later. Um, so this is a lesson in you phase a chemical out, it doesn't magically disappear um, from the marketplace. And in fact, uh, what we believe is going on here is that these residents may be bringing in older furniture um, that still contain these legacy flame, retardant uh, fl flame retardants. So these chemicals are in our, um, they're in our spaces, uh, they're in our homes, um, they're in our classrooms. Um, we always kind of presumed that they must be coming from consumer products, um, but nobody actually did the testing until about 10 years ago, we published actually the first uh, product testing paper um, that looked at over 200 um, uh, products, everything ranging from cleaning products to soaps to cosmetics, uh, lotions, and even hair products. Again, for a range of endocrine disrupting chemicals, so EDCs and asthma related chemicals. And a couple of things to point out here. First of all, is that these chemicals are found in a wide range of products, right? And we use a wide range of products, okay? So we can have chemical exposures could add up in that way. You can also see that any kind of pro any individual kind of product type can contain multiple chemicals. Um, and this is important because a lot of these EDCs actually work uh, cumulatively. They could kind of, it, it matters if you're exposed to multiple at a time because they all have the same kind of outcome. Um, and so this is really a demonstration of not only the ubiquity of these chemicals, but the, the potential here for cumulative or aggregate exposure to these chemicals. So these chemicals in our homes, they're coming from the products and they end up in our bodies. This is data from CDC's National Biomonitoring Program, the NHANES program. What I'm showing here are children less than 12 years old, um, and for their what uh, the phenolic suite or what they've now called the personal care product suite um, in NHANES, and these are the percent detected. Every single American has parabens in their bodies, um, and um, this is true. This is for children, but it's also true for adults. But we know if we look closely at these data that not everyone is exposed equal, equally to these uh, product, uh, to these chemicals. This is methylparaben, again from NHANES for children. And you can clearly see that children of color have much higher levels of methylparaben, a preservative used in personal care products, um, uh, higher than non-white children, and that black children in particular have much higher levels of methylparaben in their bodies. Why? Why are there higher exposures among people of color? Consumer product use can be uh, one of those reasons. Um, it is important, we know a potential uh, exposure pathway, and this is the particular use patterns may be leading to disparities. What I'm putting up here is actually uh, um, from a, a really nice commentary a couple of years ago that my uh, collaborators, Ami Zoda and, and Bhavna Shamasunder produced uh, or uh, published um, that they put forth this idea of environmental injustice of beauty. Uh, Dr. Martinez just talked about this. Um, this idea that there may be upstream uh, factors that may be contributing um, to these exposure disparities and health disparities that are rooted in things like systemic racism. Things like colorism, hair texture preferences, and odor discrimination are resulting in exposure and health disparities among people of color. This is really kind of the motivation um, for uh, work that I'm um, wor um, work in California that I'm part of a, a very highly collaborative community engaged study um, called the Taking Stock Study. Um, this Taking Stock Study is led by researchers um, at Occidental College, Silent Spring, and Columbia University, as well as community partners, Black Women for Wellness, and Promotores de Salud living in Los Angeles. And what What we're finding is that um, product use does vary by race and ethnicity. Um, in fact, we can see that Latinas, for example, are more likely to use cosmetics. Black women are more likely to use certain hair products and intimate care products. 
And this is important because it'll help us start to develop interventions um, in, uh, that might be effective uh, depending on the particular product in a more kind of culturally appropriate co uh, uh, way. So I've spent a lot of time taking measurements, um, exposure measurements, um, and part of doing that within a community partnership approach is sharing those results back with study participants. And this is actually um, work that Silent Spring in particular has spent a lot of time developing the right methods, uh, the, the best methods for sharing study results and is really key to doing any community-based work. Um, so this is actually a, um, just a snippet of a report that we gave um, to participants in the CDC Green Housing Study that's asthmatic children um, living in subsidized housing in, in Boston, Cincinnati, and New Orleans. Um, and we can see that people are actually using their results, um, that it is affecting personal choices, right? So people have decided, have seen their results and uh, have decided to decrease their use of uh, products, perhaps with fragrances. Um, they're bringing their results to their doctor to help them um, with their asthma management. Um, and it's also affecting community and policy change. We actually saw this in our California Household Exposure Study, where participants were actually going to community meetings and holding up their reports at community meetings and saying, these chemicals are in my bodies, um, in my body. We need to do something about this. Um, and so this is a way of, of really acknowledging the idea of, it came up earlier today, this idea of co-ownership of data. Whose data is this? It's giving the data back um, to study participants um, in, a, in a way that they can um, use it. So I wanna transition now to thinking about solutions. Where are we with identifying solutions um, to uh, mitigating or limiting our exposure to these chemicals? I think this has to happen at a multiple levels. This has to happen all the way from the consumer to the institution, maybe um, working with retailers or manufacturers, and of course in the regulatory space as well. Um, things like we have an app called Detox Me, which has um, uh, evidence-based or research-based tips for reducing exposure. Um, it involves things like engaging with healthcare industry or higher ed. Um, or informing restricted substances lists that manufacturers might use. I want to give a couple examples of solutions um, and interventions. Um, so this is data actually from our uh, crowdsourced biomonitoring study, um, where uh, we had uh, over 700 people from across the country mailed us uh, urine samples um, that we tested for consumer product chemicals. Um, and this is actually looking at paraben use, uh, paraben products, uh, parabens in products. This is increasing uh, product use along the x-axis and increasing paraben concentrations along the y-axis. And those people who say that they, what we call avoiders, that they read the product ingredient list um, could actually significantly reduce their exposure to parabens. Um, this is really great news. They could significantly reduce it. They could not completely eliminate it. That's really important. Label reading will get you so far, but not all the way to the end uh, to, re to reduce your exposures. We actually then looked at data from pairs, so people who were living in the same household who provided us with biomonitoring samples, um, and were able to actually uh, um, figure out or the contributing source. Is it your personal behaviors that are leading to your biomonitoring levels? Is it the other person living in your house, their behaviors? Or is it something in the shared household? Um, and this is really interesting. Parabens, those are on the top there. Mostly it's because of what you do um, is leading to your levels. Um, Benzophenone 3, um, which uh, BP3 there, other people's behaviors can affect your exposures. And then for others, like the 2,4-dichlorophenol and 2,5-dichlorophenol, that's more likely a shared household exposure, things like contaminated water or other sources. This is actually from an intervention study that we did um, uh, that was looking at what we call the couch swap study, um, where people actually swapped out their couches, presumably the largest source of flame retardant chemicals in your house. Um, either they swapped the entire couch or the foam within their couch. That's the cheaper option. Um, and we could see significant reductions in several flame retardants, including that legacy flame retardant, VDE 47, and um, some of the chlorinated organophosphate flame retardants went down significantly by swapping out the couch. 
Um, another intervention that was uh, pretty straightforward is um, that we actually put um, the Corsi Rosenthal boxes, um, which gained a lot of popularity during COVID, um, in classrooms on Brown University. Um, and so this is work that I did in collaboration with Joe Braun, who's at the top of that photo there. Um, and we then um, looked at phthalate and uh, PFAS levels in indoor air. Um, and these filters, it's wonderful co-benefit, not only mitigating COVID, we know um, from previous right um, uh, speakers that we know they also can reduce uh, PM 2.5 or PM levels, uh, particulate matter levels, but they can also significantly reduce uh, indoor air concentrations of phthalates and PFAS. We also know that standards can influence concentrations. In this case, flammability standards. Um, flammability standards, um, like those in TB133, which is a rather what we call severe flammability standard, um, much more stringent versus TB117, which is still a flammability standard. Um, but you can see the different, there are significant differences in flame retardant concentrations in uh, uh, college dorms in uh, different campuses that adhere to the different flammability standards. This is really important because it means even those decisions that we're making at the state house can have influences even all the way down to what is in the dust in our college dorm rooms. And here's actually another study that I wanna share. It's an intervention. I'm not sure where it fits on my multi-level because I think it actually in and of itself is multi-level, but this is a study that I'm conducting um, with uh, uh, Katrina Korfmacher University of Rochester, um, where we are looking actually at SVOC concentrations in homes that are going through HUD funded lead hazard rehabilitation programs. So we know lead hazard control programs work to reduce lead in people's homes. Our hypothesis is that it's probably also having an influence on the other chemicals in the homes, things like phthalates, pesticides, and even flame retardant levels um, may actually be changing, hopefully decreasing, um, over time as these houses are going through a uh, rehabilitation program. Um, in addition, we're also asking, what if we went in and, and provided folks with a healthy homes kit um, and education materials and referrals for um, around their healthy uh, kind of he healthy home referrals? Um, are, would they have even further um, benefits um, by being engaged in such a program? Simple thing, getting a vacuum cleaner and, and being told how to clean um, appropriately in their homes. So why community research partnerships? Right now, I am speaking to the researchers um, in the room and online. Um, community partnerships improve research. Um, you get better questions, more relevant questions out of the partnership. You get high, more highly engaged participants. We see this in our Taking Stock study right now. We're asking a lot of women they're using an app, they're collecting urine samples and all of that. And it's because they trust the researchers, the, the research partnerships that we have developed with our community partners. It's because they trust the people coming um, into their homes. So taking the time and building that trust means that you'll get better participation. It also um, improves learning. There's co-learning when you work in a community partnership. So how, as a researcher, can you be a good partner? show up, this came up in the earlier session, be available to community members, um, meaning answering questions, sharing what you know and what you don't know, be honest, um, what you know, what is expected kind of thing. Involve communities throughout the entire study, all the way from the study conception, the study design, the actual implementation, and then the sharing of the results and the dissemination of the results. Um, Pay community partners, this came up um, earlier. Um, pay community partners who are working with you and listen, of course. So with that, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators, um, draw your attention to um, some one, one way that we communicate some of our science, our science translation work here, um, coming from the Detox Me app with our top 10 tips for a healthy home um, and look forward to the questions during the QA session. Thank you very much. All right, lots to digest. And thank you, Dr. Dodson. Um, 
took pictures of all your slides. <laughs> um, so we're going, I'm now going to introduce our second speaker in the second session, Dr. Miriam Diamond. And after that, for this session, we're going to go to Q&A and, and discussion. And we're also going to try to make up <laughs> about six to seven minutes. Um, but Miriam, we're not going to cut into your time. So let me, um, the honor of introducing her. She is a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences and School of the Environment at the University of Toronto. Her research over the past 30 years focuses on understanding and quantifying chemical emissions, um, their transport processes, and resultant human and ecological exposure. Her science and policy research has been published in over 200 peer-reviewed articles and chapters, in addition to receiving extension, extensive media attention. Professor Diamond is an associate editor of the journal Environmental Science and Technology and sits on the editorial review board of Journal of Exposure Science and Environmental Epidemiology. She was the co-chair of the Canadian Chemical Management Plan Science Committee from 2017 to 2021, is the vice chair of the International Panel on Chemical Pollution, and is the chemicals and waste expert on the scientific and technical advisory panel of the Global Environment Facility. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry. Um, so with that, Dr. Diamond. Thank you very much, Gillian. Are, are we good? Good. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to present, and I'm sorry that I can't be with you. Um, this photo has absolutely nothing to do with the theme of the conference. It's just something pleasant and nice to look at. Okay, so um, the session, the workshop started this morning by uh, Patricia Fabian talking about the social determinants of health, of which housing, basic amenities, and the environment figure importantly. A recent, uh, well, it's not actually not so recent, a review done by Jim Dunn and colleagues. Jim is at the McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada looked at um, a GAPS analysis for housing as a socioeconomic determinant of health. Uh, and what he and his colleagues found was that there's a significant dearth of research on housing as a socioeconomic determinant of health, but enormous potential for conducting high impact, longitudinal and quasi experimental research in the area of particular interest is the impact of housing on the health for vulnerable subgroups. For example, Aboriginal peoples, immigrants, children, and seniors. So as I went to prepare this uh, talk, I reached out to my network to try to find work that had been done subsequent to 2006. Knowing, for example, that um, Indigenous peoples in Canada often experience terrible housing conditions, and yet I was unable to find, um, or at least nobody would share any information with me, or actually knew of any quantitative information to share. So the dearth continues. Today, I want to explain or or uh, promote the ideas that um, exposure to semi-volatiles is inevitable. And Robin, you, um, thanks. That was a great presentation. And now I don't have to explain what semi-volatile organic compounds are. Um, I want to share with you our experience in trying to understand the inequality of exposure, but ultimately these relate back to our inability to sufficiently reduce exposures to protect populations. I will comment on two of many reasons for this. The first is chemical intensification, and the second is indoor chemical dynamics persistence, which actually don't explain at all the inequality of exposure but provide some understanding of indoor exposures. I'm going to finish by talking about actions and implementation for harm reduction, definitely doing a tag team uh, presentation with Robin on this. 
I do want to emphasize the importance of the longevity of decisions that are made regarding housing. Uh, Robin talked about the importance of building materials and pers personal products that are bought, brought into houses. Decisions made on both accounts have long-term implications for exposure. Turning first to the inevitability of exposure and following this idea of chemical intensification uh, and indoor chemical dynamics. But first I'm gonna talk about the inevitability of exposure. Uh, this is a, uh, and Robin mentioned Bill Nazaroff who uh, is definitely uh, at the forefront of understanding exposure and I understand now is enjoying retirement, well-deserved. So what him and Elaine Cohen Hubble from US EPA did a number of years ago, this was published actually more than 10 years ago, they calculated a chemical production, uh, actually intake to chemical production ratio for the US population. So it's taking the ratio of intake calculated from NHANES, NHANES data to chemical production. And they did this, they, there were only a few chemicals, mostly uh, this is bisphenol A. These are the phthalates that uh, Robin just talked about. And Robin, you also talked about triclosan and this is methylparaben. Um, and surprisingly, I find this very surprising. This is uh, the intake to production ratio expressed as part per million. So if it's a thousand part per million, that means it's 0.1%. And uh, it's quite astonishing to me to see these results at about 0.1% of total production of these phthalates and higher than that for the um, more volatile phthalates actually ends up in us as humans. What's lower is BPA because it's really quite efficiently locked into um, the plastic polymer of polycarbonate. So there's not a whole lot of BPA that is released. It's, it's a much lower ratio, one part per million. And then you have at the other end, methylparaben, um, which one of the speakers mentioned, oh yeah, Robin mentioned uh, methylparaben, I believe, um, it, which is in personal care products and has a super high intake to production ratio. So this is really quite astonishing. Um, more recently, Lee Lee, John Arnott, and others did a very sophisticated model that tracked chemicals from production all the way through their life cycle, um, use stage, and so on. And lo and behold, came up with the same number, 0.1%, although all of these actually are biocides, like pesticides. And, um, and here we have personal care products, which are above the 0.1%. Anyway, so take home message is you produce, we produce chemicals and they inevitably get into us. So um, it was earlier um, this morning that Patricia Fabian talked about um, uh, chemical dynamics. And I know that the NAS panel on indoor chemistry talked about this extensively. Uh, when I first look, started looking at semi-volatiles, it was in lakes. And there you've got a lot of opportunity for both advection or in dilution, in other words, let's just smear the whole world uh, with these chemicals as they move around in air and in water. And then eventually some of the chemicals do get buried in the sediments. And there's opportunity when the sun shines for the chemicals to break down. But when you move indoors, you don't have those same opportunities. There's limited ventilation. Um, instead of the chemicals getting trapped in the sediments, they get trapped in carpets, which is tantamount to the same thing as the sediment of a lake with a historical accumulation of chemicals. Um, but what's important in terms of many of these chemicals is that the main receptor, here are my two dogs who are actually no longer with us, um, are in this system, the main receptors for these chemicals, which have very few opportunities for losses. Further, I talked about chemical intensification, which was noted in the Global Chemical Outlook report in uh, 2013, that we have really chemically intensified 
our indoor and actually all our environments. But indoors, we've got like, we don't have wood furniture anymore, right? It's all particle board held together with resins that degas formaldehyde. We have lots of electronics that are busy degassing um, flame retardants that Robin talked about, as well as other components. So we have all these sources of chemicals indoors as we continue to chemical. Oh, oh, I forgot the floor, the floor, vinyl. It's, it's, it's actually mock laminate, which is made of vinyl, uh, polyvinyl chloride plasticized with uh, phthalates. So really intense chem chemical intensification indoors with limited opportunities for um, chemical breakdown uh, dilution, actually like us uh, soaking up the chemicals. So it's pretty amazing to me um, to see how lo the longevity of chemicals indoors. So this was a great study done by Hyung Mu Shin, Tom McCone and others, uh, Debbie Bennett, uh, a number of years ago in which they modeled the indoor residence time of a bunch of SVOCs and then um, did a field evaluation. So they did it for these three uh, pesticides comparing indoor and outdoor persistence. And you can see that indoor persistence is, well, like it's orders of magnitude like thousands, like a thousand um, fold higher indoors than outdoors. And then we've done a number of studies. This is looking at DDT in homes. These are air concentrations. These are homes built in 1900, probably before DDT was used, all the way to 2000. But the, the what we found is this um, significant relationship. These are homes in the Czech Republic. These are homes in Canada. So Using DDT, like 50, 60, 70 years ago, means that it's going to stick around. So that's what I meant by the comment on the longevity of uh, chemicals used indoors, both structural, structural chemicals and chemicals we bring in. So now moving to the inequality of exposure. And I'm going to talk about um, a series of studies done. Uh, they we we had our entree to these studies through um, Jeff Siegel, who is a, um, is a building scientist at University of Toronto, formerly at Austin, te Texas. These are social housing units in, to in Toronto. So um, social housing is subsidized um, housing that is run by the government. Um, and in Canada, three uh, in 2018, 630,000 households lived in social housing or about 10% of the population. It's um, it's a, a larger number in the US, but actually a, a comparable percentage. Now in social housing, about 25% of the occupants are kids, 15% are seniors and 23, almost a quarter of those age 25 to 64 live with a disability. So really a highly vulnerable population on many accounts. So we looked at these buildings only because, um, uh, and, and this is good there, an energy retrofit was being done on the buildings. Mostly for, uh, it, it was for um, improving thermal com comfort by installing um, thermometers and improving um, heating systems. So these buildings were built in the 1970s. These are results from Jeff Siegel's work. And what he found, these are concentrations. Uh, this is the median concentration uh, of 0 0.5 to 2.5 uh, microns in the air. Um, I'm sorry, it's a fuzzy picture. And this is the, in, um, in blue, are the um, measurements made of this uh, particulate matter in these social housing units. Um, and these are pre the um, installation of, um, of the thermal retrofits. These are for non-smoking versus smoking, these two here. So let me see, I just have to check my numbers. Yes, the, the smoking units here, there were, were two to three times higher um, incidence of PM. And this is afterwards, uh, and there's not a whole lot of difference, but what's really, um, in other words, the PM levels did not go down substantially after the energy retrofits. Uh, but what's, you know, I find very disturbing is that the levels of PM were 
or two to three times higher in the social housing units relative to higher socioeconomic status homes. So then we did a, a similar type of study um, looking at exposures or um, air levels for a, a bunch of flame retardants along here and phthalate levels. So the blue are the social housing units, which were 71 units, and the orange are 51 higher socioeconomic status homes. And we were really, we were absolutely astonished and dismayed to find that the levels were consistently two to 18 times higher in the social housing units for everything, um, for everything uh, for which we don't have a good explanation. We found that the SVOC levels in the social housing units were not located to the, to the um, location of the building, the type of the building, the story in which like the, the level, the apartment level, or occupant density, there, none of these factors explained the variability that we saw for all these compounds. And I should mention that we used exactly the same method to measure these air concentrations. And I do wanna point out DEHP in particular uh, because Michaela Martinez showed us very compelling evidence of higher rates of childhood asthma in um, racialized communities. So we published a paper uh, a couple of years ago showing a relationship between levels of DEHP um, in particularly in the kid's bedroom versus, versus asthma. So there was a, a significantly higher odds ratio of developing asthma if the kid had higher levels of DEHP, especially in their bedroom. And yeah, we're finding these higher levels of DEHP in social housing than in non-social housing, perhaps related to all to the vinyl flooring and vinyl building materials, not sure. Um, next, we looked at pesticide exposure um, in these same units, but here, um, the pesticides were measured using uh, in air particles using portable air cleaners um, in the units. Uh, we find found detection frequencies of organochlorines, organophosphates, pyrethroids, um, strobilin, Caesar fungicide, and some and some others like imatoclopril. Um, of finding uh, detection frequencies, they were some were very low, and they were up to fifty percent, especially for the current use pyrethroids. Um, Harkening back to my comments about persistence and longevity, here we have organochlorine pesticides banned for DDT as far back as nineteen eighty five. So recall that these buildings were constructed in the nineteen seventies, and here you're finding a detection frequency of uh, 30% for DDT <clears throat> um, and its uh, uh, transformation products, uh, which is really, uh, really disturbing. Um, and then we found some compounds that were not registered for domestic use um, and probably because they're coming in on uh, building materials here. For example, the um, uh, these uh, strobilins, um, and we're also finding some in consumer products, but the important thing is that social housing is poor quality housing, poor maintenance, lots of vermin. So it's not surprising to be finding uh, uh, chemicals, uh, pesticides used for, for example, uh, bed bug control, cockroaches to have higher to have high levels. We can't compare this to um, non-social housing because we don't have those data. But we also found higher levels of these um, pesticides uh, that are related to tobacco use. And we found them at higher levels in units that we found evidence of tobacco use. So moving along to actions and implementation uh, for harm reduction. Um, so speaking to the Canadian regulatory framework, because 
Um, the Canadian regulatory framework, I think, works um, more in a um, in a communal way in that it's the protection of uh, of all individuals and less sort of. No, I'm not going to go there anymore. Anyways, the point is, it's weak. It doesn't matter. It's weak. It's lousy. It's terrible. So there are recommended exposure limits or guideline values, non uh, non regulatory values for long term. Oh my God! I mean, long term is eight to twenty four hours. Wow! Instead of short term, which is only one hour, for uh, for these constituents, only non regulatory guidelines. No levels at all for mold, benzene, and PM 2.5. And believe the mold is such a terrible problem, um, especially amongst many First Nations that uh, and um, increasing numbers of individuals who are experiencing flooding as a result of climate change and elevated levels of PM, of course, forest fires. And then uh, there for 25 VOCs, there are indoor reference levels mostly taken from the US. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. As Canadians, I just want to thank you for that. Um, and there is one regulation that I found, and that's for emissions. So formaldehyde um, has an emission regulation for composite wood products. So there's a little bit more, but not too much. Under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, and it was just amended in 2022, uh, a provision was added to a right to a healthy environment. Um, unfortunately, there are no um, actual um, regulatory um, measures that accompany the statement of the right. In other words, like if my right is being violated, then what do I do? Like, I, I don't know. But um, this amendment included environmental justice of protecting vulnerable populations. Uh, here's the definition, and also in, um, included um, comments for, uh, or noted the importance of intergenerational equity. In other words, what I do today um, should not impair the um, health and safety of future generations. Now, unfortunately, um, I'm, I'm really glad this passed, but we have hardly any data for vulnerable populations, as I mentioned. So here are my recommendations. Um, uh, Gillian, I think you, I think it was Gillian mentioned the um, the elephant in the room about um, about um, yes, it was Gillian who mentioned um, environmental racism, uh, and I and for me the elephant that's an elephant in the room plus the need just to address poverty. It's been said many times. Just, not just, but addressing poverty is probably the most potent remedy for improved health outcomes for all the determinants of health, including access to housing. I know that both of the, our countries, the US and Canada, are in the midst of housing crises. It's really, it's at top of the list in Canada right now of having insufficient affordable housing. We do, and Robin, you talked about this, the right, I think you did, and about right to know and labeling. And you talked about the importance of educational campaigns. Uh, we don't have this in Canada. It's something we need to have, but we know that not everybody can read labels and that will continue. Uh, we do need regulations and not guidelines. And we need this for two reasons. First of all, it provides, um, a remedy for people who experience an environment that's out that is outside of the regulations, and secondly, it uh, releases money for research. I mean, probably all of us live in envy of the outdoor air research community that has been swaddled in um, in so much uh, funding and attention relative to the indoor environment. But we also need non-regulatory levers because regulation moves so slowly. So for that, I'm just going to comment that I live within an ecosystem. Um, my goal in life is to affect change. And I do this as an academic by working with all my partners, for example, non-governmental organizations, um, 
my government, my colleagues in government who are scientists and work the pol and work to develop policy, politicians in order to leverage the media, in order to in order to affect change. Thank you. I'm done. I know I went over time. I'm sorry. So you actually queued up. We have, um, and thank you, number one, both to you and Dr. Dotson. We have um, five minutes left. Our goal is to wrap up on time at 4.30 today, and we have one more session, great speakers. We have five minutes for, um, I don't know what's online, but I'm gonna pose a question related to today's theme to both of our speakers, which is, if you had two and a half minutes, which you actually do, um, you had a regulator in front of you who wants, and you want to be able to communicate to them a next step. You wanna talk about regulating consumer product, building product, about ventilation and filtration, um, regulating by chemical. What would you be able to say to them to further their thinking towards this end point? And I'll go ahead and Dr. Diamond, I know you can't see Dr. Dodson's here. The table first, we'll start with her. Uh, well, that's a big question, and uh, I would love that opportunity. Um, but I do want to say one thing that I think is particularly important um, is that we we collect a lot of samples and we collect them on and analyze those samples for a lot of different chemicals. And something that is extremely clear to me is that we shouldn't be thinking about all of this one chemical at a time. That we need to think about this as a class-based approach, um, right? I think PFAS is an excellent example of that, where we can kind of can't chip away at one or two of them. These are highly persistent chemicals that will be in our indoor spaces for decades to come. Um, and so we cannot take that one chemical at a time approach. Um, so I think thinking of things in a broader context, thinking about things from a class perspective um, is going to be uh, really, really important. Um, and I also think about doing that in a way that is um, to increase transparency too. I think that's something that is in increased transparency in supply chains and the products and the building materials, all of that is going to be key as well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Diamond, and then we yeah. have Dr. Carter online. Oh, I'll just I'll I'll add to Robin's great answer. Just um, adding some uh, regulatory limits for the indoor environment for indoor environmental quality, because without regulatory levers, we don't have any remedies, and we also don't have the ability to push a research agenda and and ask for funding. Um, it's just a, an important impediment. Ellison, welcome and hello. And would you like to share anything? Uh, sure, thank you, um, Gillian. So I think the question that came through um, pertaining this session, both, um, both speakers, which thank you very much for your presentations, um, had to do with what you've observed over time related to detection limits and how our ability to measure um, in the field has evolved over time. So uh, one question that came through is our, our detection frequencies at the same limits of detection um, changing over time? So detection limits have been going down, but I have to tell you that all our results were uh, achieved with low resolution instruments because I, I don't run a fancy lab. Um, so our detection limits are not particularly uh, super low. Um, so no, from uh, the results that I presented are not a mat are not a function of detection limits. And remember that a lot that that of the, some of our at least my my take home messages are a comparison between low and high SES homes. And that's not a detection limit issue. Yeah, and I would just add that many of the chemicals that we're looking at are well above and have always been well above the detection limit. So I don't think this is suddenly like detection limits are falling and, and we're seeing these chemicals. Phthalates are found, you know, a hundred times, a thousand times higher than the detection limit and they always have been. Um, so that it's not like those are suddenly appearing because of the analytical chemistry that we have been there and they will be there. Thank you for addressing the question. Um, Gillian, if there's time, yeah, I want to time for, like... we have a, just like two minutes left. And if you'd like to share your own personal experience, observations, or pose a questions to our presenters. Oh, um, sure. I think it, it may be 
difficult to be brief on a question like this, but I think both of you did a really nice job of highlighting the complexity of chemistry indoors. And when thinking about communicating with um, people who live in those homes, could you comment briefly on the tension between wanting to report things that we know uh, really well, what their impact is on health and how to take action and that that action is within the agency of the occupant versus things that we know less well and that perhaps the person living in that environment may have less agency. Can you speak to that tension just a little bit? I know we have very limited time. Robin, did you want to go first? Or, um, that it's, it's, it's an issue um, and it's something that we have been tackling a lot in our work, right? You can, it's pretty clear how to report lead levels back. We have a, we have a regulatory threshold for that. We know the health effects. Um, there are resources and referrals um, for lead hazards. Um, for things like endocrine disrupting compounds, it's a little bit trickier. There are no regulatory levels um, to point to. Um, and so we communicate the best way possible. We communicate what we know. We communicate how we know that these chemicals um, in the laboratory studies and other places um, are affecting our, um, our health. Um, so we communicate that. We oftentimes uh, do comparisons against other people in the study, against national biomonitoring data to provide people with context. But I still think that even with some of the uncertainty around what we do know about either the health effects or the fact that there's no regulatory threshold, people want to know. Um, and people have a right to know um, so that they can inform their own actions. Um, and so it is, you know, I believe it's the right thing to do is to share the results and to provide some um, opportunities or strategies for reducing exposures. Um, and folks can make those choices with the inf as long as they have the information. Right. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Diamond. Did you have, you had a, uh, yeah, a I pause, did. a pregnant I, I, pause. <laughs> I, I know because I talked too much, so I didn't know if you wanted me to speak, but I'll try, I'll be brief. I, I struggle. We struggled with this a tremendous amount because from, uh, for most people, there's no choice. They don't like in social housing, you don't have a choice and you don't know where it's coming from. And you don't know what the health effects are. And you're already stressed out enough by all sorts of things going on. So I actually, we, there was actually um, a considerable, dis, there was some disagreement amongst co-authors about how to move forward with this. Um, I, so I, I struggle a lot with this, with that question. Because it's just like, it's another thing to worry about when your life is already full of worries. Yeah. Uh, good point to end on. So we had some really good questions um, for those of you online who submitted a question um, to both our presenters. We're going to come in order to give full time to our next speakers because we have we want to hear fully from them. We're going to go ahead and if you can, we'll answer them offline or we're going to bring your questions back during our final Q&A um, in just a bit. That way we can uh, move right along. All right. Thank you both again. Thank you very much.